This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. We'll get started then. So should I call the meeting to order or? Okay. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee, I'm calling to that meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. on Tuesday, December 15th. Um, we'll take a roll call attendance. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, <laughs> um, I'm calling to order the meeting of the regional school committee at 6.31 p.m. Um, and we'll start with roll call attendance. Mr. Demling. Demling still present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan present. And McDonald present. Um, and we also have um, a, a few guests, uh, Dr. Slaughter, Dr. Morris, um, Ms. Richardson, and um, Ms. Charkas, who is um, taking notes for us. Thank you very much. Um, and our first item on our agenda is the ELL program report um, from uh, Ms. Richardson. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris and Ms. Richardson for that. Sure. And I want to thank the committee for your flexibility. Ms. Richardson has an LPAC meeting, or excuse me, BPAC. Sorry, I can't keep up with the acronyms and initials, but it was a good change. It's just not stuck in my head yet. Sorry, Ms. Richardson. Um, uh, at 7 o'clock, um, so that's the Parent Advisory Council um, uh, around bilingual and English language learners. So uh, we appreciate you fast-tracking this to be at the earlier part of the agenda before public comment and other, other items. Uh, because it related to both the Amherst and the regional schools, we also appreciate getting both committees together to be able to have this conversation. Um, and I'll just do a little 30-second uh, intro and turn to Ms. Richardson, given the time, um, that we it was something that we wanted to do. And uh, we had an outside reviewer or evaluator come in last year. And, uh, you know, as you saw from the executive summary, meet with, with staff members, look at data, uh, and make some recommendations for us in our program. We plan to share this with you last spring. Life changed, um, so we did not. Uh, but, you know, some of the work tonight, even at the BPAC meeting in a couple minutes, we'll be going over some of the, this information, uh, sharing the executive summary and uh, taking some next steps around the programming. So uh, we appreciate your patience. Um, and thanks, Ms. Richardson. She's consistently uh, and appropriately said, when are we going to get at this on a school committee agenda? And tonight worked really well. So um, thanks for your patience, Ms. Richardson. And I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Um, as Dr. Morris said, it's it's been a long time coming, um, but it it felt important because you know it's a um, it's a report that we'd like to take the opportunity in the winter and spring to kind of start planning next steps. Um, so it you know as we were thinking from the spring to the summer to the fall, it didn't feel like there was ever a good moment, um, and yet I want to start to have the dialogue with our staff and our um, families and the school community about kind of where we go from there. So um, yeah, so here we are. So I'll try, obviously I could talk for hours about everything that's in this report. So I'm going to try to just um, share sort of some of the high points that I see um, or takeaways that I see. Um, and then I'm open to questions from all of you. Um, so, uh, you know, part of this was where we originally came to doing this review was through our DESI review a few years ago, where they did um, find a couple things that they wanted us to work on in a corrective action plan. And so one of the steps in that corrective action plan was to have someone come in and work with us on an evaluation um, to get an outside lens on how we were doing. So that was um, where this came to be. And so I think it really, you know, it's, it's, there's so much to include. 
um, and you've gotten the snapshot here. The work of the ELL program touches um, over 250 students. Um, it's, you know, our students are spread out across the district in all buildings. I mean, there's a huge impact and, and lots to talk about. Um, and I'll say, you know, even though there are some places where such a short report focuses on next steps and what we need to do, I think it's just super important to recognize the amazing work that our ELL staff are doing. Um, I've had the great opportunity to visit and observe in a lot of classes in the last month, and it's fabulous to see what they've been able to do. Um, the quality of instruction and the outreach to families, um, the engagement is, is really excellent. So I just want to note that um, even though that's not necessarily highlighted here. So in the summary, um, a couple of the points that stood out were uh, in terms of next steps. So they talked about some of the strengths of the SEI program. So this gets pretty technical <laughs> pretty quickly, but the sheltered English instruction. Um, in general, we talk about that as having the component of ESL instruction and sheltered content instruction. Um, so that's an important distinction to keep in mind that they were both looking at how are we doing when we're um, when our ESL teachers are providing instruction and how are we doing when our content teachers are providing instruction, which is made to incorporate English language development throughout the curriculum. Um, so you see some language about that in the report. So, you know, there are plenty of strengths that they highlighted in terms of um, our policy, that we're well resourced, that we have a lot of people that care a lot um, about our students and that really work hard to continually improve our practices. Um, one of the areas within the SEI program, they, they state, uh, stated that we are not in complete alignment with sound educational theory. Um, and the highlight of that, or the thing that we have to really think about is the, the amount and the way that we use primary language support um, in terms of supporting our students that are learning English. So we have this great resource in that we have a fabulous interpreter staff um, that are largely bilingual and bicultural, and they do amazing work to support our students. Uh, the challenge comes when we try to figure out how much of the curriculum is actually being delivered in another language versus being delivered in English and scaffolded so that our students are also learning the English of the content. Um, so that's an issue that I really look forward to talking more with the school community about how do we kind of hold on to that resource and that support, um, but shift it a little bit so that it can sort of, it can provide the support, but also boost our students in their English language acquisition. Um, so that was a big piece. There's a, uh, a large component around the fact that English language development is not yet systematically enacted as a core component of content instruction. Um, a couple years ago, some of you may remember that the Department of Education rolled out the SEI endorsement course. Um, and while that was a great start, that certainly isn't enough to, um, to get us to the place where we're really embedding those practices in a systematic way. So that's just a long term goal to continue um, working and supporting staff and really giving them the time and space to collaborate to infuse those practices into their teaching. Um, and certainly we've made great progress on that and we have more to do. So that was an area to look at. Um, when they, let's see, when they talk about students not making adequate growth, um, I think a couple things that I've been looking at closely are the percentage of our students making progress on access. Um, so of significant concern is the secondary level, um, the ELL students, the percent of them making progress over the last five or six years has continued to decline. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but it's something that we need to look at as a community and see how we can do better. Um, so we did go from about a 60% making progress rate in 2014 down to a 12% progress rate in 2020. Um, so it's definitely an area of, and it's not that it was one fluke here, it really has been a trend. Um, so that's something we have to look at pretty carefully. Whereas our Amherst numbers have stayed more consistent, um, more in the 50 to 60% of students are making progress, which is on par with the state average in that sense. Um, let me see, what else? 
there's so many more things that I could say, but I guess those are the biggest ones. I think um, there's some commentary around curriculum and professional development, ongoing need for collaboration. Those are all parts of our practice and they were cited both as strengths and areas to continue growing. Um, so I think that's kind of in line with what we would expect. Um, yeah, so it was, it was really nice to see to have the opportunity for somebody else to come in and look at what we're doing and give us feedback. Um, and I think what you've gotten was the executive summary, but the um, full report does go much more in depth and give a lot more specifics and suggestions that we'll be able to engage with the community going forward. So I'm happy to open it up to questions or comments. Mr. Denley. Um, yeah, thank you for the overview and, and, and for forwarding the, the report summary. Um, I think um, Caminantes uh, gets most of the public attention recently when we talk about English uh, language learning in, in Amherst Regional Schools, um, which is, you know, great, but it's it's also good to be able to um, take a look at, at, at these resources as well. And so when I think about resources these days, I think about budget, um, given that we have other items on our agenda um, tonight where we're talking about the prospect of um, what what the superintendent has termed catastrophic potential <laughs> uh, impact the budget. So uh, a million or more cuts at the region, and we haven't talked about Amherst yet, but you know it's the same, it's a, it's a similar funding um, posture there. And so I think about the impact this could have across the region and to different programs that we might not talk about a lot. And so I think about all of our ESL and SCI staff and um could you say a few words you know if, if, if you were hit with say you know major staff cutbacks next year um given these additional things that we want to do right out of the report what, what kind of impact would that have on on students so in terms of how we're able to reach and support students what would that that decreased number of staff from what you have now how how would that impact um their their learning experience um, that would be very challenging, absolutely. I mean, we're staffed well, I think, right now, um, just to meet the needs that we've seen in the, in the student population over the last few years. We have grown um, the secondary ELL, FTE overall to match the fact that we've had more students coming in with greater gaps in schooling, and that's been super, super valuable um, to be able to support our beginning readers that are coming in at the middle and, and high school level. Um, so that would be that would be a huge challenge to try to condense uh, the teaching that we're doing of content, of language, of literacy um, for students that really need all of those skills. Um, I think, yeah, there, we're, we have significant paraeducator support and those folks are helping students access the content um, within the classrooms. Um, and I also see that coming out of this year, we're gonna have an immense need to continue a high level of support. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a really great job keeping up where we are, um, but it's not the same experience of a full day in school. So I do have that concern, yeah. I think Dr. Morris. Uh, I think the other thing I wanna note is, I think what the department's done well in response uh, and kind of even before this report was completed, was just recognizing that we have to differentiate, particularly at the secondary level, when we have students who are coming without language background in their first language. Um, so, you know, we talked about the, the SLIFE position that was added um, at the regional level. And so I think it allows us to distinguish between between you know ELL groups, I mean, we talk more, frankly, at the committee about special education, and there's no such thing as like the typical special education student. Like, you know, it, it just because a student has a learning disability doesn't mean that they can be well placed necessarily with other students with learning disabilities uh, to meet their needs because each each student's needs are different, and that's true. The same, uh, I don't want to say ELL students are special ed students, but from an, a programmatic point of view there is the same level of distinction that we want to cut based on what students' learning profile is, what their home language is, uh, strengths in their home language uh, are, and their educational background in their home language, because that's going to have instructional implications, right? So, you know, I think, you know, 30 years ago, maybe everyone put students who were just learning English in the same classroom and figured it would all work out. And what we, what we know is that it doesn't all work out, that we want to be much more deliberate and intentional 
about how we meet students' needs based on the background experiences they have. And, and you can only do that if you're staffed to do it. And so I think that's, that's one of the other elements that I want to stress is um, what we're trying to do, and I think this report really calls for us to do even more, is be much more intentional about how we're working with students, uh, English language learners, um, and how we're thinking about English language learners, not as a monolith, but as very much um, individual students with individual learning profiles. You know, I'm not looking for IEP-like <laughs> uh, necessarily um, documents for every ELL learner, but I think there is, you know, you look at the evidence and the results, not just in, in Amherst, but across the state. And I think we do need to think about um, what the needs are very individually. And to do that, you need the staffing to be able to pull that off. Um, so I, I think I just wanted to add to Katie's point. Just We've seen an increase in the last five, 10 years of students who are coming to our English language learners coming to our district uh, without, without uh, for a whole host of reasons, without a full level of educational experience uh, in, their, in their first language. And that's a really different profile um, for us to be able to support. And, you know, I think that's when you've seen some of the staffing shifts and, sh and changes, it's really responding to the different needs that we have in our schools. I, I apologize if you, if you stated this earlier already and I missed it, but um, when you talk about the increase in SLIFE um, students, what just order of magnitude, what percentage or proportion of our students are that within our ELL program now? Katie, be better able to hazard a guess on that yeah, one than me. I'm going to guess maybe 15%. I'm just, it's not, I have to look back more closely, but ballpark guess. Yeah. Hey. Um, we did look at, um, interestingly, you know, there's the piece with the primary language support um, and what what percentage of students who are in their first year of arrival are um, receiving primary language support or are students continuing to have that support longer? So I remember seeing that more clearly in the report that we had about 20 to 25 percent of students, it, um, particularly at the secondary level, that were in their first year. Um, so that also gives a sense, you know, there's, there's students that come with limited home language literacy or, or math skills. Um, there's also just how many students are beginners and, and maybe have that academic foundation but need additional supports to access. So there's a lot of different considerations there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're if I could add one thing, I don't, I don't wanna hug, and there may be other questions, and I know Ms. Richardson has a meeting at seven, but um, I think the other thing we note is that um, there's a fair bit of transiency within our ELL population, both coming in and going out. And so that's another challenge from a staffing perspective is that um, it's not necessarily the same cohort. It's in, in nowhere in our district is the same cohort of students, but our English language learners tend to have um, a slightly higher level of transiency. Um, and it, it forces some decisions on, on us. And, and some of that's known, right? We have students who we know are here for six months or a year. Other students who we know are going to likely be here for much of um, their educational career. And so that's another just layer of differentiation that occurs more in the English language learner pro, um, student body than in the general population as well. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none. Well, thank you, Ms. Richardson, for um, joining us this evening and in, on the tail of, or. Uh, um in front of your next mm -hmm. meeting so i appreciate it thank you absolutely yeah i'd love to come back and uh hopefully there would be some space in the spring to hear where we are in the process of kind of working through some of these issues and you know in more detail um but i'm glad to be able to share that much at this point so thank you all great have a great night thank you. bye uh, okay um Great. Uh, so now I am going to, um, um, I'll move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Um, is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> um, moved by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. Um, and there's no discussion, so we'll uh, take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. And now um, moving on for region. Um,
I don't, I didn't see minutes in the packet. Dr. Morris? Yep, so Ms. Figaro and I are almost caught up on just uh, all of Ms. Uh, Ms. C uh, Ms. Cielo, Ms. Sharkis's, excuse me, uh, the minutes that she's sent in. I think our first meeting in January, you will have a long, long list of minutes to approve, but we just wanted to get them organized instead of doing them piecemeal. So uh, we'll have, at that first meeting in January, um, it'll be a very long packet of minutes, uh, and I apologize for that, but I think we'll, we'll have them all caught up and then we can clear the deck and, and get going on a, on a better uh, kind of weekly meeting timeline of approving minutes. So um, we'll, we'll, we're, we're just about there for me tomorrow morning and we'll, we'll finish the loop and for that early January meeting, we'll get caught up. Um, can I make a, a request slash suggestion on the minutes since we'll be reviewing a, a whole slew of them and I'm sure our memories will be fuzzy. Um, would it be possible to include as the first page for each, each set of minutes the agenda for that meeting? Mm -hmm. So that we'll see the agenda and then the minutes, then the agenda and the minutes. I think that might help us go through them. Okay, so um, we now move on to public comment. Um, and we have two voice messages and um, a packet of documents. I'll start with the voice messages. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Hoffman, and I'm a resident of Pelham with students in the eighth and ninth grade. I'm leaving the public comment tonight specifically to any teachers and APEA leadership who are listening. 2020 has been a difficult year. We've all faced challenges due to the pandemic, racial inequity, and turbulent economy resulting in lost wages and jobs. Many of our teachers have risen above and beyond their challenges, these challenges to provide the best education possible given the hurdles they faced. However, those same teachers who are known for excelling are the same ones that know the best way to educate the future of our society, the best way to provide the education to our students is through in-person instruction. To that end, I implore all teachers to reach out to your APEA leadership and request that they return to the negotiation table with the school district. The current MOA is not in line with scientific data that we now have about the transmission of COVID. Continuing to be in a fully remote learning environment is harming the education of our students, harming the social and emotional well-being of our young people, harming the financial stability of our district and most importantly, creating insurmountable inequities to our most vulnerable community members. Did you know that Amherst and Pelham are two of three towns in Western Mass that have not had some form of in-person instruction since October 26, and that the other town, Plainfield, now has a date of returning to in-person instruction in January? The current MOA's metrics are based on fear and are not flexible to allow for adapting to the new facts we have about COVID and safety. The current MOA has resulted in our schools being an outlier to all other districts. We are last in getting our children back to in-person instruction, and we are last in putting the needs of our students first. In addition, since 2019, the district has had a status of requiring assistance or intervention from the Department of Education for failure to make adequate progress for low, particip low participation rate among students. This has been made worse due to remote learning. If this trend continues into year five, our district could end up in receivership similar to Holyoke. No one in our community wants that. With in-person in instruction, we can make real progress in increasing participation, and especially in our most vulnerable students. Teachers, please follow the facts and the science. Understand that we know and can follow measures to keep everyone safe in in-person instruction. Don't allow others to speak for you. It is time to return to the negotiation table and create metrics that are reasonable and based on facts as we now know them. If most other schools around the country and the world can place in-person education of their students at the top of their priority, so can we. It's time to put the education and needs of our students at the forefront of the discussion. Please put students first and ask the AP. Um, just so folks listening at home understand, um, this uh, the, the recording, the voicemail um, set up for Google Voice actually cuts people off exactly three minutes, so that was not me. So. Hey, my name is Bennett Hazel. Um, I live in Amherst. I'm the parent of a Fort River elementary student and a middle school student. Um, first, I want to thank the teachers for the amazing, truly amazing job they're doing. Uh, I have a front row view into their classroom work at both the elementary and middle school level for, for my kids. And I'm amazed. 
know they must be working twice as hard this year, and I don't want to lose sight of that. My comment today is really around timing. Um, it just takes a long time to get things done following established processes. Um, you all in the school committee have to get meetings booked, get readouts of meetings, schedule more meetings, engage with the public, engage with the administration, the union, and so on. Um, I think it's important for the union to commit to a meeting with the school committee right now so that we all go into the holidays knowing there's a plan in place to allow us to process what we've learned about how the virus spreads among children, what other leading school districts around the state and the country have learned from their disparate experiences, how remote learning has impacted kids right here in our schools, and how things are going to change with the rollout of the vaccine where teachers in Massachusetts are rightly prioritized to receive it. For the sake of timing and momentum, I just don't think we can afford to close the books on 2020 without knowing that when we return in 2021, there's a plan in place for engaging teachers by way of their union in this conversation. Standing still and just cleaning the plans that were made in September isn't the right thing to do for anybody. We've, we've learned so much, and that has to be reflected in our plans. Thank you. So I'm sharing this document for folks um, that aren't able to see it clearly on, on their screens at home. This document is posted um, or will be shortly posted on the Regional School Committee agendas page. Um, so you can read it at your leisure later.
So as mentioned, um, this uh, that document will be available on um, on our website on the agendas page of, for the regional school committee. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, we are now moving to the superintendent's update. So I'll um, hand it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure, and it's, um, it's a, a somewhat lengthy one, so I'll, I'll be sure to pause a couple times to see if there's questions as I go, if that's okay with the chair. Um, so um, I'll start, um, I'm not going in the order I thought I was actually, but uh, I'm going to start with the uh, vandalism at, um, that was out, that occurred outside uh, Amherst Regional High School to start with. Uh, and what I'm going to do is read the statement that was um, that was sent out to all staff uh, and all families. DR, this went out yesterday on Monday, the 14th. Dear ARPS community, last Friday afternoon, racist and anti-Semitic graffiti was found on the sidewalk outside Amherst Regional High School. These chalk drawings, which included a racial slur and a swastika, were photographed and quickly removed. However, the drawings were a blatant violation of school policy and more importantly, our community's core values. No one should have ever come to work, should ever have to come to work or school and experience discrimination and bigotry in any form. Since the incident occurred, we have been using the tools available to the district to investigate the incident and identify the person or persons who committed this hateful act of vandalism and have been in communication with the Amherst Police Department about this illegal act. The graffiti left outside ARHS comes at a time that there is a disturbing escalation of incidents of bias, bigotry, and hatred within our country and throughout the world. It's a clear reminder why, why we are unequivocal about doing work to make our school community an actively anti-racist institution. In recent years, our schools have engaged in anti-racist educational programming, both for students and staff, designed to broaden perspectives and great, create greater cultural understanding. We are fully committed to continuing this work as, as clearly we have still have, as we still have much to, work to do, comes to embodying a fully inclusive, hate-free, and an understanding community. Understanding that the information about this incident is of great concern and will, many will have strong feelings about it, counselors are available for students who want to discuss their thoughts and feelings. The district also acknowledges that this will impact personnel as well as as well and will be planning and offering opportunities for follow-up for staff further information will be forthcoming and the signers are myself doreen cunningham assistant superintendent talib sadiq principal amherst regional high school and dave slovin principal summit academy at amherst regional high school i went out a little bit uh more than what was in the statement uh, i think um scott got a really a nice a nice nicely written article today in the gazette uh, one of the questions that that we were asked, uh, that I was asked, was, you know, why did you publicize this? So few students would have seen it because schools are closed, right? So, um, and you know, I think the response was, uh, our response was that if we're serious about being an actively anti-racist institution, one thing anti-racist institutions do is they publicize acts of hatred, right? And they let the community know what's actually happening, and there's nothing to be kept quiet about this. It's true that there were very few people who saw the. Um, the vandalism, and at the same time, uh, those few people did, and it still happened in a school that, you know, in our my vantage point, belongs to the students and staff, even if they're not physically there at this time. It'd be no different if it was in the summer or during February break. We want to communicate that. I want to really thank, um, you know, Mr. Sadiq, uh, Mr. Slovin, uh, a bunch of other people who have been involved in trying to work on this. The high school met with students on Monday afternoon to try to um, right size and guess, right size the wrong verb, to, to really gather their thoughts and opinions about uh, what students needed. Um, there was an optional staff meeting as well uh, at the secondary level, at the high school level for that. I know Fort River and some of the elementary schools are doing the same uh, to make sure that um, staff uh, can identify what they need, uh, you know, and, and how they can be supported. And so this isn't sort of the end of this. This is really just, um, you know, sort of a, a shocking um, and jolting reminder of the work that we continue to need to do. Uh, and we can't do that if we're not engaging with students and staff uh, about uh, what the next steps are. I also want to thank a number of people from the community have reached out and organizations, religious organizations and other organizations have reached out. Um, they're happy to partner and meet with students or staff and provide their resources and support to us. And so, you know, we're deeply appreciative of the community's response, which was um, kind of very consistent with how we felt about it, that we were disturbed and distraught about it. Uh, and people wanted to come in and help. And so I just want to, you know, really appreciate um, the community, uh, both of staff, students, and the larger community for how they've responded to this. And, you know, I will say one of the, 
one of the saddest moments was um, trying to understand, um, you know, over the weekend, how other communities, how often this happens. Um, and there's some things you shouldn't Google search, and this is one of them. Um, it does seem like they're racist uh, words and swastikas um, out schools um, is a common form of vandalism, perhaps more common than, than I was uh, understood before I <laughs> looked around for it. Um, and it, um, it doesn't stop, right? It's, this isn't the first time it, this has happened at school, and it won't be the last time. And that's, that's perhaps in some ways almost the most disturbing thing is the frequency uh, that these types of events happen. So our job and our task is how do we support the community um, to, to grieve um, and also how do we support people to be able to um, work within our organization to make it better every single day because we clearly have a lot of work to do. So sorry that was long-winded, but you know it's something that is certainly uh, in, a, in, in a week with a lot of other things happening in the, around the world and locally, it's taken a lot of um, you know the focus to where it needs to be, which is kids and adults, uh, and how do we improve our organization? Any comments or questions about um, that topic before I move on to the plethora of others that I have to talk about tonight? Um, you know, and I, again, I want to just thank our team for coming together and spending a lot of time together over the last five days, uh, working on this and figuring out, you know, again, the, the, what's the, what's the response we want to have. And, and, you know, I'm glad that we did publicize it, even though it's uncomfortable for, for people to read and it caused reactions from everyone who read, who read what happened. Um, there's not any part of me that feels like that was uh, a decision that should have been kept to a very small number of people who saw it, just given the, the content that was there. So on a more positive note, um, the on Friday in the newsletter, you all may have seen that we published a, a um, set of documents for ventilation testing uh, that showed um, the full results uh, that we have, as we have them now for all the schools in the district. I know this is a regional meeting. I'd like to just show a uh, screen share one, one of them. I'll show the high school, I think, or the middle school, whichever one comes up on my screen first just to show the, the types of things that were there um, to the high school. Now let me zoom in a bit so that people can see that a little more. So the first part for every school was a table and it was the room number, the grader program. Uh, this one is the one I want, actually want to speak to, the minimum, minimum number of supplemental air purifiers required. As you may remember, we bought um, HEPA UV light air purifiers that do increase the number of, uh, that increase the ventilation in rooms. And this is not saying that if z you see a zero, that there aren't air purifiers in them. It's just that they're not needed to get to the four eight changes per hour um, that consistent with the ASHRAE standards and consistent with our agreement with the, the APEA. And so um, what you see, uh, the next column is, um, you know, how many air changes per hour without the purifiers. And the last column is the total with purifiers. Now, it's an important caveat here because when you see all those zeros, most of those rooms have air purifiers. So the actual number that we're experiencing is significantly higher than what's on the right side. We just wanted to have a chart of what's the base layer and how do we show that each room gets over four or doesn't get there. And I, I, I actually, before I scroll, I actually wanna note an appreciation for all the facilities, maintenance and custodial folks our middle school and high school and Summit Academy, they are not new buildings, right? The newest part of them is older than our students significantly. And so the fact that as you all scroll down, you'll see that most of the rooms are over four without any supplemental air purification uh, is really a testament to the ongoing work. It wasn't like something that happened this summer, right? It wasn't like, oh, yeah, we got COVID. Let's fix our rooms. This was years and years of high quality maintenance and high quality staff. <laughs> Uh, doing work over time, but I'll just scroll down and, and you'll see, you know, you'll see some rooms with a one next to them uh, and on the right side, you'll see where they land. Uh, but these ones, these rooms that say zeros, most of those rooms, just about all of them actually have purifiers in them. And the real number is quite a bit higher than ventilation, but we just wanted to show that actually the majority of the high school hits the ASHRAE standard without any supplemental purification. I know I'm scrolling quickly, but this is all on our website. Um, and you can see the middle school, high school, a couple of rooms need to be you know, tested. The testing results were inconclusive. Um, 
And then the the other thing, I want to thank Erica Vergara, Vergara, excuse me, in the facilities office, she made for every school a map. Uh, and what you see, there's color coding at the bottom. You are not going to be able to read that, but the light blue, the, the white area is not currently approved for classroom use. Those are generally small spaces at the high school, spaces without windows um, that we wouldn't be, they're not instructional spaces. Uh, the light blue has zero air purifiers required. The kind of medium blue has one. Uh, you see a couple of those like here. Uh, and the dark blue has two or more purifiers required. Um, so this is the, the, the two upper floors and you see a couple rooms need to be retested, but the vast majority of rooms um, had sufficient air and ventilation on their own, even without the, the uh, purifiers. So I, I wanted to show that because I got a couple questions after the newsletter went out um, about that. And the short story is, uh, the summary, I should say, is for the number of students, uh, the percentage of students who desired uh, originally a return to in-person education, we have more classrooms than we need to educate every one of the students who indicated uh, an interest in returning as it relates to ventilation um, based on at all of our buildings. I know this is a regional meeting, but I'll speak out of turn and just say that's true pre-K to six. Um, so really a uh, tremendous amount of thanks needs to go to our maintenance facility staff, and not only uh, working with Nexus to do this testing, the really helpful maps. Some people love looking at that numerical data and tables. Some people just like show me a map and show me what I'm supposed to see and which room's going to be in. And, and so, you know, the fact that we're able to offer both is fantastic. But more fantastic, I think, is that we feel like our rooms are ready to go and we now have com com confirmation evidence. We had enough, you know, before in terms of phases one and two. Uh, but now at all of our schools, we, we have plenty of classrooms for the percentage of students who said they were willing to, their families wanted them to be in school uh, if we get to that place. Uh, we still are working on those rooms that are in the that are not shaded yet that need retesting. Nexus was in, I believe, this week or will be in this week um, to do some additional testing and uh, retesting of rooms. Uh, that after our facilities department looked at some rooms where the testing was inconclusive or came in low, so you know we're not satisfied that even though we have enough rooms, we want to get all of them on board. COVID's not going away that quickly, um, and we want to make sure that we're ready to go at any point for all the rooms at our disposal. But we have no shortage of of well ventilated classrooms ready for students and staff to return to when that date happens. Any questions on this topic? Lots of questions. Um, Ms. Lord. Thank you. And if you'll forgive me, this is actually a response to the topic before, but I just needed a moment to catch my breath. Absolutely. May I? Okay. Thank you. So I just want to say historically, this has been happening for years. My senior year, a racist slur was um, written on the American flag. So thank you for making it public because truthfully, I hear about students seeing racist words on desks and bathroom walls and the facility staff is quick to clean it up and paint over it, but we don't end up having these discussions. And it lands in a painful way to those of us who are targets of racist or anti-Semitic slurs. So as we learn more about being an anti-racist and an anti-oppressive community, I hope we start having more of these difficult conversations, accountability, training, and education. We got a lot of work to do and transparency is an important step. So again, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lord. I appreciate and agree with everything that you said. Ms. Kenny, were you um, raising your hand for a question or um, comment? I was mostly cheering that there are spaces for all students who wanted to be back in um, classrooms uh, when we can return to in-person schooling um, and how, you know, just a huge thank you to the maintenance and facility staff for you know, those aren't quick fixes. And it's because people were on top of their game for years and years um, that it was able to happen like that. So I just really appreciate it. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so um, th there were assertions made um, by the APEA executive board that I learned about in the press last week, that these ventilation reports were not available and also that we don't have enough space for the students in our return plan. So, I mean, so just to clarify, cause you went over a lot of technical detail there, Dr. Morris, you're, you're saying these reports are publicly available and, and we have more than enough space to service the students according to our, our plan for in-person for, for all three phases. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. 
And it was, this it was emailed out to all, it was in the newsletter, which goes to all staff and all families on Friday. Okay, so, um, okay, so that helps. Um, on the point of, it, so in the press, you know, it, it was framed as these were conditions that the APA executive board was making uh, to come back to the table to re renegotiate the MOA. And as, as far as I understand it, um, our, our committee sent a request, our last request on November, November 2nd to the APA executive board asking them to talk, uh, to be clear, not to agree to any changes, right? Just to come back to talk about changing the, the MOA. That was six weeks ago. We haven't heard anything. So ha have have you or the chair heard from the APA executive? Have these these concerns, these the ventilation reports not being available and um, not being enough space, the, the idea that there might not be enough space for all the kids. Were these concerns sent to you from the board in the last six weeks as conditions of renegotiating or, or have they have they ever been before they appeared in the press last week sent to you? I can say I, I saw the newspaper article, I, I believe you're referencing. I did not receive any communication directly in the last week uh, around conditions for renegotiation. Um, I didn't receive any emails with any information about that. I can't speak for the chair. I cannot speak for the chair, not that I can, sorry. I, I did not. Okay, uh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, thank you. And, and you know, I, I keep saying it, but I think it is worth saying because it's a group of people that, that doesn't often get or actually want the limelight, but I'm going to give it, <laughs> put it on them anyway. Just you know, real huge appreciation. We talked about the, our leadership team, just making sure that custodians and and maintenance folks kind of recognize that the the level of work. I mean, there's a neighboring district, uh, and I want Mitch one. They do not have a standard of four air changes per hour. It's a lower air air change per hour. And when we originally agreed to it. Um, they said, well, you know, that's crazy. We have like, you know, four classrooms in our district that are going to be, that are over four uh, air changes an hour. And, you know, we have the the, the vast, vast majority uh, of classrooms, even without the additional ventilation we're supplying um, over that. And we don't have new buildings, right? It's not like West Springfield High School or something that was built in the last six years where one might just assume, oh, well, it's built in the 2010s. Like, you know, they probably are all set with ventilation. That's not our schools. Um, so, you know, just want to restate that one more time. Yeah. Um, Ms. Seeker? Sorry. Dr. No, Mr. please. Uh, sorry. Um, just following up uh, on what Mr. Demling was saying. Um, sorry. A little, this this just popped into my brain. Um, in terms of, of numbers um, for ventilation and maps of the school, because I too read that article and was surprised because of sitting on the school committee, I know we were seeing maps that the administration put together in August and September. And we started to see numbers for the rooms that you anticipated using in phase one and two. So I, I too was surprised to read that. And I just want to say tonight that um, this, this email that you put together with this full report in it is not the first time that these numbers have been out there. So I just want to speak that here because people who might be watching might not realize that that's not the first time that these numbers were, were publicly shared. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The new information is really on some of the phase three rooms, um, which we never got to phase three, you know, in terms of in-person, um, but you're right. Phase one and phase two we presented, and I think that was put on our website, I think it was September 29th. Could be off by a day or two, but it, thereabouts. And just to put a finer point on that, we, we had phase one students in for, for a week and they were 100% of the phase one students that wanted to come back were back in rooms, in, in, in classrooms that were meeting these these standards demonstrated to be. Yeah. Mr. Demling, did you have another question? Yeah, I mean, it it seems kind of, I mean, I guess, I guess we have to just state the obvious, but I mean, Dr. Morris, you, regardless of what's publicly available and who said what for how many cookies, you, it, it, there would not be any point ever, right, that you would ask staff or students to come in person to a room that doesn't meet those ACH re requirements, correct? Yeah, no, all of our classrooms in phase one, you know, which is as far as we got, were in spaces, um, occurred in spaces that were had been previously tested and were above four air changes an hour. So um, I think I'll move forward, which is um, 
two oddly juxtaposed points, but I'll, I'll make the first one first, which is that um, we all have concerns about mental health and COVID winter. And, you know, we appreciate that um, Courtney and Sarah from the Bright program, not ours, but at the kind of the, the more general, they support all the Bright programs. Uh, they're clinicians and they'll be back on Thursday. We're doing a 3.30 event. So, you know, there'll be a lot of snow on the ground. The tip tea, sip your tea or hot chocolate and whether it's for, you know, kind of middle upper grade students, um, certainly all of the regional students would be, it would be appropriate for their families and staff, uh, working through how to right size, uh, expectations that we all have for ourselves, for school, um, for our children as we head into this winter. And so I, I feel like both as a educator, an educator and as a parent, I learn a lot every time I talk to Courtney and Sarah. So, uh, it'll be an interactive session again, like last time where they'll, they'll probably do about 20 minutes of of uh, presentation and chatting and about 40 minutes of q a you know, use on using the the live stream and the youtube so we encourage everyone to go uh the, the odd juxtaposition is uh this morning and um trying to be um not so boxy on this one but i'm not sure how successful i will be uh the the state board of elementary and secondary education uh in a split vote passed regulations about um live instruction uh, it's a topic we'll have to come back to in early January. Um, I'm not opposed to having regulations about live instruction, but the justification was that uh, that there's live instruction or, or four hours a day of live instruction was directly tied to students' mental health. Um, I have not seen any evidence that supports that that amount of live instruction is uh, directly tied to students' mental health. It's uh, my professional organization, Massachusetts Association of Schools, school superintendent spoke out loudly against that uh, proposed um, vote today. Uh, it did pass seven to four, I believe, um, at DESE. Uh, so we'll come back to this. This would be more of a concern in um, some districts I work for that are not um, legally called to order right now. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, not so much at the regional level. Um, but I do want uh, wanted to communicate that and that the kind of the justification that I was directly told as were other superintendents is that that's, there's some minimum number of live instructional synchronous hours that corresponds to students' mental health. And I, um, I struggle when there's not evidence behind statements like that. So that's probably as much as I'll go into. It'll be certainly a topic we need to come back to, um, at least at some of my committees uh, next month. Um, but it is, it is a big deal. It is, you know, was debated for hours, I believe today. Uh, I did not watch the full live stream because I didn't, my day was too busy and I, I couldn't squeeze it in. Um, but I did want to let you know that there, there are going to be some recommendations of, of live synchronous hours for instruction. And there's a kind of waiver system based on parent feedback. So we'll have a lot to talk about when we get back in January, um, particularly at the Amherst and the Pelham level. So uh, this is probably as much as I can share now, um, but it's just queuing, queuing you forward to uh, future agenda topics. Allison, put your hand up. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm calling myself. Um, just a clarification question. So live instruction is, um, is part of, but not the same as um, time on learning, correct? Yeah, I shouldn't have confused. I said that in the... Uh, uh, not the clearest way. Time on learning is the standards that we always have for how much instructional time there is. This is about live synchronous instruction as opposed to asynchronous instruction. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, something else we'll come back to, and I know Ms. Stancer brought up last time, is how are we doing in terms of attendance? Um, I've some tentative good news to show that um, in the last five weeks, we have seen um, we're not resolved in terms of some disaggregated disparities around attendance, but they have narrowed. In other words, you know, in particular, um, if you look at Latino student attendance, um, that was a cause of concern. Um, that's still a cause of concern, but the concern has been, you know, numerically is shrinking uh, based on the efforts of our administrative staff and other staff who are, who are trying new strategies out. Um, and the Distance Learning Center, which I know has made a huge impact on many, many students. Um, so thank you to Amherst Recreation and Mark Smedow After School, because I know they're doing fabulous work with, with our students. Uh, I go up and see kids all the time there. So I'll come back in January with that, but I, I didn't want to not respond to Ms. Dancer's very good question last time, but we'll have more soon on that topic. But um, our IS department did run a, a report that um, 
initial report that showed um, some gains in the areas we'd want to see gains in, and we're not there, right? It's, it's both good news and not good news, right? Good news that we're seeing gaps narrow, not good news is that there are still gaps. So I want to be explicit about both of those things. Um, let's see, testing. Um, so uh, when we, we do have test kits um, this week, um, COVID test kits that are antigen tests, they're for symptomatic individuals. And um, we, our nurse leader, uh, Robin Supernaut, has to go undergo some training. But when we get back from the um, two week break that we have this year for, for the December holiday, uh, those will be ready to go. So any symptomatic individual in our distance learning center located at the high school will have uh, antigen, tests, uh, antigen tests, tests on site uh, that can be taken with, with a relatively quick turnaround. Antigen tests, to be clear, do need a confirming PCR test, but it's, um, it really helps that process flow. And, and um, so we appreciate the state support. And I really want to thank, thank Robin Supernot for jumping in to Jill Consolino's shoes when Jill uh, left us. And she's doing fantastic work for us. So um, also of note that UMass is, um, has opened their um, testing center at the Mullen Center to community members for asymptomatic testing. Um, so thank you to UMass for that. In addition, the town of Amherst is doing kind of a one morning fill in the gap um, symptomatic testing, uh, or if you're quarantined uh, on Friday morning this week, this will go out to all family students and staff, or all families and staff tomorrow, um, just with both those options, um, because what we real what, what the town realizes, is it's great that UMass is open and you can't go to UMass if you're symptomatic, right? So there's, there's sort of people caught in the middle. Um, and if, you know, I think if the need is there, they may look to see if they're, they can continue that intermittently in future dates. So I think from a testing capacity perspective, you know, both, you know, within our distance learning center and beyond, if students do come back in person, um, you know, I think our capacity does see, appear to be growing locally. Uh, I will say, you know, it's been a crazy week, right? We had the electoral college, we had the, the vaccine stuff. Um, it is pretty amazing to see the vaccine, you know, roll out and, you know, under the state's plan. And we'll see, you, you all know me well enough to know I tend to be pessimistic on timelines. Um, uh, but, you know, within the next um, three, four months, um, it would be that the vaccine would be available uh, for educators in our district. And that's a really exciting development. This, this far exceeds my uh, lay estimate on how good the vaccine would be and how quickly it would come. So kudos to all the researchers around the world who are working on this. Um, and, and, you know, probably like many people, I got a little emotional watching um, the person in New York uh, get that test uh, yesterday. And, and, you know, you know, it's like the enough history was yes, yesterday had enough history in it for like years and years. And it just all was smacked in one day. Um, but, you know, pretty, pretty exciting stuff. And I'll just we are working with the town of Amherst on vaccine site and and uh, how that rollout would be not just for our educators but actually for the larger community that we do want to partner with them we do have access to resources um, large spaces uh, outdoor spaces that people could get vaccinated and so you know emma dragon's been absolutely fantastic i'm sure ben would uh, agree with me uh, in his work with her uh, just really connecting with the schools frequently i talked to her today we we, we talk uh, very very often and everything going on so um, good news on that front um, this is a really long update. I apologize, but um, there's a lot going on, and we met last week. Um, uh, on the less good side, is we are seeing, you know, statewide and locally, an increase in the number of, of positive cases of COVID. Uh, we are seeing also locally as statewide um, that in-home spread uh, is a significant factor in community spread. In other words, I'm not suggesting that people only get it inside their homes, but when someone in a home gets it it's highly likely that that spread happens very quickly within a home environment. And that's predictable. People aren't necessarily wearing masks in their homes. There's basically no ventilation uh, or, air, you know, um, in terms of air changes to our home environment and people are less distance, right? Um, and so we're seeing that, you know, statewide has been written off and about, but, you know, the health department's noticing that trend is happening, you know, within Amherst as well as within our communities, not just Amherst, but uh, our larger communities as well. As a result, uh, the health department made a recommendation that we pause all in-home um, services. We do have students who are getting receiving in-home services for special education needs. Um, and then if we're able to write that, so they're not, um, the second part is on us, uh, transition those services if, if we can service students and if families agree to our school setting. Uh, where we know the ventilation is good to the earlier conversation. 
We have professional cleaning. We know people are masked. You know, some students may not be able to wear masks all day because of a disability, but all the adults are wearing masks all day long. Um, and uh, there's a lot of controls. There's a nurse there. There's testing on site. All those things that aren't true in an in-home environment, and as the weather's gotten colder, the ability to do outside outside testing is getting harder and harder. I mean, if any of you spent any time outside today, it'd be hard to concentrate, um, you know, academically in that setting for long stretches of time. Um, so we did communicate, um, you know, pre-K to 12 with staff and families this week uh, about that change, about the pause in in-home services, uh, and we are working actively with families if we can figure out how to service students um, in our distance learning center. Uh, we'd like to continue to support students by offering the services that we know they need to make effective progress. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, from the health director's point of view, there is not a concern about students being in the school setting because of all the reasons I mentioned, but there really is a concern about the in-home. Uh, and it's a concern on the employee safety part, um, as well as on the family safety part, um, just because the transmission rate in homes is really driving um, a significant amount of the spread. Um, I don't want to get too much into the science of it, but if you, if you Google it, you'll see a lot of um, percentages and numbers um, that, that really... Um, that site that perhaps even more than half or, or significantly more than that uh, of spread is happening within homes. And I want to be really clear, and I said this twice at JLMC, I think with Ben, uh, our, our non-public meeting on Friday, um, I'm not suggesting that, that in-home is the only place that it's spreading, that there's no transmission outside in homes. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, because I know that message gets confusing and gets political, but what we are hearing from the health department is when COVID enters a home, the spread happens very, very quickly uh, and very definitively. And that's why the recommendation is to pause in home services, see if they can be delivered in a, in a, in a school setting that's controlled with ventilation, professional cleaning nurse um, and COVID testing on site. And so uh, we're communicating with families. We're trying to work things out as best we can. There are obviously our limitations that we can't control in terms of you know, contractual limitations to do that. We do have in the MOA that in-home services can continue. Uh, there's not necessarily the same kind of clause for kind of that version of in-home services in the school setting. Uh, you know, our, our distance learning center at the high school for special students with intensive needs um, is often much like a home setting in that it's either one-on-one -on -one in a classroom or two students and two adults in a classroom. Um, but in a 900 square foot classroom with good ventilation, the health director is not concerned at all about uh, us continuing that program is really the in-home that, that where the concern lies. Um, so our staff are doing a great job communicating that and trying to problem solve as best we can. Uh, again, we have no dearth of classrooms at the high school, so we're not concerned about our capacity to, to, to find spaces for students, but the, the challenge is how do we staff that and, and are families uh, willing to bring their kids in when they weren't originally, right? The, the students, most of the students receiving in-home services had made a choice not to be in person. Um, and so um, it's a hard conversation because you know how valuable the services are. But again, you, you're going to hear, I'm a broken record, right? When I get a recommendation from public health authorities, we're going to implement it and, uh, you know, appreciate Ms. Dragon's point of view on things. Mr. Demling. So a uh, question and a comment. So to clarify, it's, it's the Amherst Public Health Director's determination that it's safer for staff to service students and by the way, these are our highest need students who can't benefit from remote learning at all. Uh, it's it's safer to service these students in our school buildings rather than directly in homes. And that's her professional health determination. Is that correct? That is. Exactly. So my comment is, and I'll, I'll try to keep it together for this comment, but my God, we have to figure out a way to staff this. Like... Uh, I understand, everybody here understands the contractual, you said it more deftly and obliquely and eloquently than I could, Dr. Morris, but like, I don't know how else to say it <laughs> to the public and to the community. We have very high need students who can't benefit from remote learning. We need to get them in the buildings. <laughs> we need to service them in the buildings. We can't sacrifice their education like indefinitely because of of issues of, of other other issues that can't be resolved and i'm not, it's a comment not a question dr mark because i'm not expecting you to give me a solution right now and I, I know you understand the level of this challenge but i just I, I i struggle with trying to articulate this publicly uh in a productive way um 
you know, and then go to CPAC and then come back here and then talk to parents and then see everything that we're seeing on public comment. I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to be a pragmatic, <laughs> pragmatic public official here where I'm representing the public interest and not letting my emotions get the better of me, but it's, it's pretty darned hard on this one. Um, so I just, this is why it's a comment and not a question. So, so thank you for listening. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, um, I actually had to start going back a little bit to the vaccine piece um, <laughs> and then comment on this. So I just, um, I am super excited about the vaccine. I similarly was feeling like tearing up while watching, um, you know, uh, the videos and getting news that the people I work with are gonna be vaccinated this week. It's just, it's huge. Um, I also, um, I'm concerned about already, you know, fear that there's misinformation out there. And so I'd like to ask the committee and Dr. Morris, like if we can, in the future, I would really like to have us dedicate some time to thinking about ways that we can make sure that good information is getting out there because this isn't an FDA approved vaccine yet. It's got this emergency use authorization. So we're not gonna be able to say all students must be vaccinated um, in the way that we have with the flu, you know, employees, same thing, it's gonna be optional. So I think until it gets that FDA approval, it's gonna be really, really essential that we build confidence in the public in this vaccine and, and encourage folks who, when it's available, and I know it's gonna be a while, especially for kids, um, right. that's um, available, but I, I, I think if we can start, you know, laying the groundwork for, um, implementation and adoption of the vaccine, I think it, if we can, it's great. And obviously work with a public health director. Um, so the other, um, I just wanted to also um, state my support and ask like, are there any, you know, barriers that we can help you overcome with regards to trying to move these services from being in home to in um, safer environments like the schools? Because I, you know, today, I think I shared with you this, you know, CDC study that came out and it showed that actually, um, for inside school was not associated with um, increased rates of COVID in, in the study that looked at kids in Mississippi. But um, visitors in the home, there was a strong positive association with a positive COVID-19 test. So I think that the data is out there that supports um, the public health director's um, recommendation. And so if there's anything we can do to help overcome those barriers, I, I think we need to do it. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And maybe I'll come in a little bit because I think we talked about the staffing side, which which makes sense. I think there's also the education for the family side, right, is that, that's equally as important. And, you know, Chris Cusack, who is um, the coordinator of our intensive needs programs, K-12, and Elizabeth Burns, who is the preschool coordinator, are doing a great job, I think, being really clear with families, not not coercion, obviously, but just saying this is the recommendation. This is why the recommendation was made because I think there is just an abundance of information out there and for families when you're thinking about kids and if there's a medically vulnerable kid, right? These are really, really difficult choices that there's no right or wrong to from a family perspective. Everyone's got to make the right choice that feels feels like the right thing to them, but we want them to base that choice on science and data. Um, and uh, as much as we can provide it, we're trying to, and again, not in a any way that it tries to compel anyone to make any action, but just that people can ask questions. Um, and again, that's where Emma's a fantastic resource for us because she can, you know, filter data to us that we can share on. So, uh, and thank you for sending that that report, Carrie. I was I was able to take a look at it this afternoon. I appreciate uh, you sending it. Okay, I promise I'm I am getting close to done. Um, but uh, a couple more is just, I want to thank the PGOs and the Family Center for the coat drive and coat swap. Uh, we know how important that is in the winter. Um, so they're doing a great job and doing it in a kind of distance manner this week. Um, huge benefit for our families as we head to winter. Um, and uh, also the Family Center taking on the kind of winter gift drive that they do with staff um, to give to make sure that um, families have gifts for their kids, uh, especially this year, it takes on uh, renewed importance. Uh, it is a two-week break uh, that we have as voted by the school committee. Uh, I also want to note, well, some people are really excited for that break. There's other people that that's going to be a long two weeks. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we had lots of conversations actually at our kind of district level leadership team today and really want to thank our HR team and Doreen in particular for really thinking through how do we reach out to folks who might be struggling during those two weeks? Um, cause that's a really long break. And, you know, again, my, we don't live in Florida, right. And you can look at the good parts of that, but, you know, I can imagine the, the two weeks in Florida in December might merit some more easy outside time than two weeks in New England from what I'm seeing from like 10 to 15 inches forecast on Thursday, right? For some people, they rejoice about that. For people like me, um, it, it means uh, winter's really starting and, and that's not necessarily the happiest moment. So just want to note that and just be sensitive to each other and to others because I think, you know, some people don't celebrate uh, any holidays over the break. Some people have a whole lot of holidays. Some people have family locally that they you know, can still see outside other people's family, uh, they're not gonna be able to visit. And this is the first time in a holiday season they're not gonna be able to visit. So just wanna balance that, that sometimes we think of breaks and a long break being wonderful. And that, that's just not true for everyone in our community. So wanna share that publicly and really appreciate Doreen's thinking about how to approach that. Speaking of this, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, will um, food service meal, meals delivery continue? Thank you. So Yep, so food service is doing two drop-off days. I want to say it's the 22nd and 27th, but at all the food drop-off sites, they've been communicating that to families about uh, those two days where they're doing seven days of meals, like huge boxes for families who come get them. But that's that's sort of what they're able to do with the holidays and their employees needing to take time off. But we're covering every day. Um, it's just going to be in two very large boxes for families. That's that's wonderful, and, and thank you to the the staff for working during the break to make that happen. That's that's really great. Yeah, they've they've been fabulous. Um, so my last one is talking about snow days. So you know we talked in the summer uh, when it was nice out about snow days and not taking them if we're in a remote or actually if we're in any environment. And we're going to do that on Thursday. Um, there's no way anyone's going to be in buildings unless the forecast changes a lot on Thursdays with the amount of snow and especially the timing of the snow. Um, that's just not going to happen. We're, we are going to do a remote learning day, but tomorrow morning we're going to send out a survey to families and, and to staff. Um, I've heard mixed things from people in Hill Towns. I know I've talked about it here about internet connectivity during a storm. I've also heard from staff members who rely on going to school uh, for their internet um, and some mixed feelings about snow days. So we're going to, instead of just making an executive decision, we're actually going to collect a bunch of data from families and from staff about how they'd like to see us manage um, snow days and then I'd like to bring that back in January so we can come to kind of it is in the superintendent's court on that one but I'd like to talk about it both with you all and publicly because I think having the opinions of the lived experience of, of families who especially in a remote environment are playing a very large role in this as well as uh, staff members uh, what are the implications on days where there's a lot of snow for them and be able to provide that I think is the best approach so Thursday we'll move forward we won't have a virtual snow day on Thursday. Thursday will be a, uh, will continue as a, I don't know if I'd say typical day of school, but a day of school. Um, but we're going to be soliciting feedback to come back in January to think about how we want to approach this winter um, as it relates to snow days and, and the impact of snow on people's ability to access distance learning. So more soon on that one, but I just wanted to share, you know, sort of where we were and then I've gotten feedback and uh, not everyone was thrilled with the idea of not having snow days. I do want to note our school year is scheduled to end on June 24th. So there's not that many snow days we can have before we have to go back and start taking away April break and things like that, that people may not necessarily be enthralled about doing, but uh, we want to gather data. Uh, I'll bring it back to you and we can make a kind of a decision that's informed by uh, the experience of um, our constituents. So that's all I want to say about Thursday and, and, and then about uh, collecting data to come back in January to talk through more. Any and that's the end of my very lengthy update. I apologize. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Okay. Seeing none. Looking around one more time. Okay. Um, so next item is um, chairs update. And um, I want to take this opportunity to, there, there was a, a, a lot, an hour's worth um, of, <laughs> of information in and, uh, Dr. Morris's uh, update and a lot of comments and discussion. So I want to take the opportunity to kind of synthesize a lot of that um, and then also call attention to a couple of items that have been published or shared in the last week that relate to learning during the pandemic. Um, one was shared during our meeting last week 
um, a statement from pediatric physicians at, at Bay State that describes the significant and negative impacts that extended distance learning is having on youth in our region, including increased rates of physical and emotional illnesses um, to the point of ICU um, uh, hospitalization for some of, the, for some of the, those youth. Um, and their statement concludes by saying, quote, we must provide these students the option of in-person learning coming from physicians at Bay State. And today, as Dr. Morris mentioned, and thank you to Ms. Spitzer for sharing that report with me as well, um, the CDC published a report of a study that states that among the children under 18 that they studied, attending school or daycare in person was not associated with a positive COVID test result. I mean, that builds on all the, the data that we saw coming out of other countries and their, their um, public school experiences uh, um, during um, in-person learning during the pandemic. Um, we continue to hear from parents, including in tonight's public comment, describing the despair that they're feeling as their child struggles or regresses in the absence of in-person instruction and support. Um, and we read in the press about the APA concerns about the district's plan for in-person learning. And I'm pleased that the district has been able to address those concerns already, either before the expression of those concerns or with the phase three spaces and some of the retesting um, just very soon after. The district has the plan in place to bring 100% of the students who choose in-person learning into school buildings, in classrooms that provide for six feet of distancing and ventilation that is documented to be at or above our guidelines. Because of the careful planning and hard work of many district staff, the district has sufficient PPE on hand and has documented safety protocols in place to support in-person learning. The district is ready and we are ready for our students to return to schools for in-person learning this spring when case counts are declining again. I hope our teachers and union will collaborate with us as we develop the plan for returning to in-person learning. And either way, as I stated last week, I'm prepared to ask the superintendent, superintendent to develop a plan that can get our students back to the in-person learning they need. Um, so hopefully I caught us up on some of the time. Um, we'll move on to school committee announcements. Um, and I believe Ms. Stancer, you had an announcement. Um, I just wanted to announce that um, the budget subcommittee has a meeting scheduled this Thursday at 6.30. Um, we, I would like clarification and help on two points regarding that. My understanding from our last meeting was um, that we have not really told a very good story about budget cuts in the past and how things have happened in the past with the budget and that we needed to do that. We need, so I, I'm understanding that that really is the goal of at least initially what the subcommittee needs to do. And I just wanted to be sure that that was the understanding of the full committee. And the other is what kind of a timeline are we looking for um, to have some kind of a, a draft perhaps to present back to the entire committee? That was, um... I think it part of I think the second part of your question will get answered when we get to the agenda item 20 FY 22 budget outlook um, because we'll have to talk a little bit about timeline I'm sure there so that part will get answered okay and yes that is was my understanding of our ask of the budget subcommittee was to help um, build that explanation okay That's one more one more part of that is what is our intended, who is our intended audience for this? It was brought up in the context of the four town meeting and one or more people from Amherst, the Amherst group saying that we haven't really told a story about what's happening with the schools and budgets. So is this, do we want a broad sort of public audience for this or do we want something narrower? Those are um, all great questions. And I'm thinking maybe we can fold those into our conversation about the budget outlook when we get to that agenda item so that we can actually have a, a discussion. Um, okay. Cool. And, and please bring it up again if we don't get, if 
<laughs> we don't talk about it in there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Lord. Yes, I would like to announce that tomorrow there is a school equity task force meeting at six o'clock till 730. It is on the district calendar. Thank you. Okay. Lots of announcements. Anything more? Um, so we'll move on to a new and continuing business. Our first item is um, a holdover because we didn't get to it last week, which is the discussion, this, beginning our discussions on the 2021-22 school year planning. Um, we had talked about wanting to have this conversation earlier on when we were adding it to our agenda, we talked about um, creative ways that we could um, address the, whether it's the school calendar and starting earlier to address the likelihood that not all of our students will be vaccinated by, by the time the new school year starts. And so we wanted to begin early so that we could have the conversations and plan appropriately for any change to calendars um, and set up for the school year. Um, I think that's sort of the background and context for this discussion. Um, and I'm not really sure where folks want to start. So <laughs> I, one of the things that we had talked about just again to recap from the last time was some of the potential um, constraints or um, conditions that we'll have to consider um, as we think about when might be a good, um, when, when we, how early we could push back a school start date, given that we don't have sort of sufficient air cooling in uh, in all of our buildings to to um, support hot summer days in our schools. Um, so there was some amount of investigation in terms of facilities to be able to support that as well. Dr. Morris? Well, I'll just pick on one topic um, and then uh, that relates to next school year because it is timely. Uh, which is, I'm sure many of you saw that the Northampton School Committee voted to change the start times of their schools. And I, uh, every virtual conversation I have with uh, any student in the regional schools, uh, within five minutes, usually closer to 20 seconds, uh, the conversation turns to we're really going back at 745 next year. Like, that's really going to happen. Um, so, you know, what I'd like to propose to this committee, and I, I don't want to dominate this topic isn't synonymous with late start, but it is just something that uh, I am meeting this week with our facilities and transportation folks to just try to see what options are available. We did have a report completed a couple a year and a half ago uh, on this topic, uh, and not to say that we should definitely do it for the next school year, but what I know is if we don't have active conversations in the month of January, we will have committed to not making a change in start time for next year, because uh, it's just not something that we've thrown together last minute. Um, so that's something, if the committee doesn't want to put that on future agendas, that's fine, and that decision's made. And again, I'm not pushing for it, and that wasn't a guilt trip in terms of middle school and high school students, but it is just one of the things that, in terms of things that need to be planned way, way in advance, um, you know, that, that seems like an important one, and obviously there's implications across the board and uh, for student staff um, and families. So just something on my mind, you know, however you all feel, I'm still gonna meet with the facilities and transportation folks this week and talk about what's possible. But I know that that is one that I'm consistently getting feedback on from middle school, high school uh, students and families. I have a comment, but I'll let uh, Mr. Sullivan raise his hand. So, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I just wanna remind everybody that for the past six years, I have been a big voice of no, we can't go to a late start because of the two schools, Leverett and Shutesbury in Union 28, where they had a whole different bus company and it was just, it was going to affect the start times of the two elementary schools, which would then mess up the other two elementary schools in the, that district. And with just Five Star as our bus company, it seems to me that we could get the Shutesbury routes and the Leverett routes where different different drivers did the elementary than the high school high school and middle school where in the past it they've been having to do both the same middle school and high school middle school and elementary school routes and that's not the case anymore. So as I have stated before to Mr. Demling, 
that Shutesbury is all for a late start now that it does not affect the elementary schools. <laughs> Dr. Warren. And just on that note, I do have a meeting with uh, Ms. Culkeen, Superintendent Colkeen from Union 28 later this week, just to talk through, you know, after my conversation with facilities and transportation, just talk through any implications and, and you know, uh, we want to make sure we're coordinating across the multiple districts and not forgetting about Shutesbury and Leverett. Um, we never do, but we want to make sure that we're, we're being really transparent and open with, with um, those folks as well on that topic. So I'm glad you brought that up, Mr. Selvin. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Um, I guess I would just like to say that I think we should definitely keep this in our discussion for next year. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so in terms of the overall topic of the ne next school year, I, th I think the best, the most uh, efficient approach for our committee and superintendent between now and the start of next year would be to kind of divide and conquer these sub um, projects within the overall umbrella of next year. So later start time is one of these sub projects, right? The other ones, um, Ms. McDonald mentioned at the top, but just to kind of iterate my bulleted list, one is what is the calendar start date? What's the first day of school, right? That kids go back. We know the fiscal year begins on July 1st. Um, but what is what is the date that, that students go back? Are, are we talking potentially July? Are we talking August? What, what, does, what does that mean? And that really is to the facilities exploration that we talked about earlier. Um, I think the third major bullet there is what is our posture on in and our promise on in-person learning, which for me is what's driving, at least for me, is what's driving this kind of exploration. And um uh and you know, we kind of have a a clean slate opportunity. I mean, it's as as far as it, so Dr. Morris, actually if you could clarify this this point. So the current MOA, it that that's for this school year. So that expires on June 30th, 2020, correct? That is correct. Yeah, the first line of the document, I think, centered and bold is regarding okay. the 2020, 21, 21 first school year. Okay, so yeah. that's, that's actually a helpful piece of information for the public to know. So as of July 1st, 2020, there is no MOA, there's no memorandum of agreement. So we have a a, uh, a new opportunity there to define what we want to define. You know, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about in person on day one for X number of students? What is, you know, what's the whole thing? You know, so that obviously relates to, you know, uh, student preference and staffing and all that, those, those kinds of things. Um, I think if we try and approach all of these topics in the sim same agenda item going forward, it's going to be <laughs> near impossible to yeah. jump around and make progress on. I think the other thing too, Dr. Morris, that, um, you know, to, um, to overburden your plate a little bit, because I like to do that, is I, I really appreciate a couple of years ago um, when, we, when we first started talking about what are the potential solutions for the... Um, for the, our, our building needs at another committee that we both sit on. Um, you had, I think was was a pretty helpful framing presentation that didn't say, here's the solution, but you said, okay, here are the things you want to consider. Here are some of the the variables. And, and you gave us a taste of kind of what your vision was. It wasn't necessarily a, you know, uh, putting your your finger on the scale for a preferred solution, but you, you gave us a sense of, of where you were going and, um, you know, if we're talking about really out of the box, if we're thinking about really out of the box things for next year, I I, I really would want you to kind of lead that 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 guide at least guide us through that the, that vision space. You know, not to think talk too um, fluffily there, but um, you know, we do need a little bit of of guidance and 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 high level kind of um, contemplation there. But well, what does it mean to have you know? two or three months of school in the summer, you know, it's, it's assuming the facilities can can handle it. Or what does it mean to compress vacations and, and whatnot? And, um, and, and and what are the major factors, even in a vaccine world, that we, we're going to have to consider if we wanted um, a much different in-person in -person posture for, for starting next year? So those are, those are my initial thoughts of how to approach it. I don't have a lot of opinions other than yes, of course, as late start as late as we can go, um, but um, those are my initial thoughts. So I really like that idea because I think this conversation would be much, even if it was scaled down from, I know the presentation you're talking about, Mr. Demling, and uh, I think it then might itemize topics in a way that promotes better dialogue. Um, so the thing I'd ask is, and it could be now, but probably better off um, just following up individually with me with an email, the types of things that you all are wondering about, uh, about the 2021-2020 school year so that I can itemize them 
and put them um, in that same way that uh, I think a really good suggestion, Mr. Demling, uh, that, that could be presented on because it may be that, you know, not everyone's in agreement, but if we put the whole thing together, then we, at least we know what we're all talking about. So, you know, I'd love just if people had topics, like I know in-person education is one that you, you all have talked about in the past. Um, I know late starts one, you know, but I think if there are other topics that you all have, if you could, you know, email my, the chair and myself uh, with those topics, then I think when we come back in January at some point, I can put those together into a more comprehensive presentation that engenders the di kind of dialogue that I think is going to be hard to your point, to, to have in, in the absence of such a presentation or the absence of such a structure. That makes a lot of sense to, to me. I don't know how it feels to the rest of the committee. I, I think um, if we're just referencing back to one of the, your objectives for this for this year right. is, is really is to reflect on um, th you know, things that we want to consider holding over um, as we go forward. And one of the things that, um, that, that is on my mind when you talk about in-person in learning and, and we as a committee have, have committed over and over again to prioritizing in-person learning and I don't see that, I mean, I'm not gonna speak for the committee, but it's unlikely that that's going to change. That said, we also, you know, I've read um, and you know that it's unlikely that students, that youth are going to have a qualified vaccine um, much before the new school year starts. Um, so, Part of me also is thinking that we need to have a plan for are we, you know, you know, how far are we going with the in, per, in prioritizing in person learning and, you know, how much do we need to, to continue to offer an option for remote learning um, for students that, that will need that slash want that. Um, yeah, I think in particular, um, I think that's true at the secondary level and in particular at the elementary level, which it's from what I read, it's more likely that that vaccine for 12 and under will come later than. 12 and over, where at least there's some trials started. I look at my other people on this committee who follow this stuff too, but that's my understanding at the current time. Mm -hmm. So how would we structure our, our school year differently or our school year plan, knowing that a, a, a large number of people may be um, vaccinated, but maybe not very many of our students will be. And Ms. Spitzer, you had your, saw your hand. Yeah, um, thanks. I, I, I was thinking the exact same thing as you were, <laughs> Chair McDonald, about how, how we may need to continue a remote option. But the other thing I was thinking if, if um, is that a lot of these are questions where I think it would be good to get some stakeholder feedback um, and not just unilaterally make a decision as a committee, obviously. So I'm trying to think in this new environment, because <laughs> one of the nice things I'm like thinking back to, I'm assuming to, to, to what Mr. Demling's thinking about is, you know, we had these listening sessions where community members, you know, so sat around tables. And, and so I'm just trying to, I, I'd like to see us try to come up with a way to do some of that um, virtually, and it's going to be really hard, but I think it's going to be essential. Um, especially around things like start time and you know some of these things that are harder or I mean I don't know I I just want to add that to the things that we're considering is like how do we make sure that we get parents teachers uh, you know anybody who's going to be part of these conversations to the table as early as possible Dr. Morris yeah and I think going back to Mr. Demling's analogy to another committee and and you know a challenge I think the way that we I would hope to do that is if we can structure our presentation to engender the conversation, then, you know, have listening sessions in the same way as, you know, it's possible, but I think we need to have some, some more tangibles to bring to a listening session other than we're like sort of interested in late start and maybe some other stuff, right. Or like a calendar, right. Like, you know, I think that that's where my job is to fill in some of the pros cons or what's possible, not possible. So that, that conversation, the feedback we get is valuable because I think when we, when we go public with looking for feedback and there's no constraints, it's just, it's a recipe for people to get really frustrated. Like you're using my time and I'm suggesting these things and then you're telling me they're not possible. Like, why are you actually asking my opinion? So I think the more we can be um, a little directive on here's the pros, here's cons, here's things to think about, what are your thoughts? That can actually, that's where stakeholder feedback can influence decision-making much more than if it's kind of like listening session with no context or content. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gemley? Yeah, so I really like that suggestion from Ms. Spitzer. Um, I think, um, to, to Dr. Morris's point, um, I, I think given the time schedule here, we're really just going to have to embrace the imperfect messy. 
you know, in, in a non-COVID land, we wouldn't be starting the late start discussion, even though we're not starting, we've talked about this before, um, you know, in, in January uh, if, and potentially thinking about it for July, August or September. You know, we wouldn't be start, we wouldn't be thinking about radically altering the start, contemplating radically altering the first day of school um, this late, right? And and I, th I think it's, and it's, it's the same thing for, you know, in-person approach, but it's just, and there's going to be a, a lot of other things that are going to be um, pulling for our attention, our school committee and superintendent attention next spring, right? Budgets and then um, contracts, not the least of, <laughs> not the least of which. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not, there's, we're not going to have as much time as we ideally would like, I think, for any of these threads. But that's, that's the nature of it, right? The, the other option is to not do any of it and just, just to go with what we have to fault. So it, I guess, to me, it's real, it's going to be a little frustrating because we're all, we really want to be doing a lot more, not just with engagement, but in reflection and, and other analysis and stuff. Uh, but it's, it's a real uh, perfect, not the enemy of the good kind of situation, um, like like probably most things in COVID times, but I think especially the kind of scope we're talking about. Okay. Any more discussion on, on this? So um, I, I heard as a, as a follow-up that if there's other items or, or threads, um, as, as Mr. Demlin called them, um, that we want to uh, con con consider for, for next year, um, email Dr. Morris, copy myself, um, so we can uh, look at that in January. Great. Um, next up is the JLMSC update um, from uh, the meeting that happened on Friday. And I'll look to Mr. Harrington to, to kick us off there. Yeah, so uh, not, a, not a ton to update here. We, we did meet on Friday. Um, th there was a lot of discussion with, uh, with Emma Dragon, with, with the, our public health director about, uh, you know, vaccines, these sorts of things. But um, to, to kind of give everyone the little heads up here. Uh, Mr. Sullivan and I had actually sent an email and, and it was an agenda item that we wanted to talk about kind of the efficacy of our MOA and how that's been a, working out for us, but we haven't gotten to that yet. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get to that this week. And uh, I'd say that the biggest change though, I will say is, is uh, in terms of communication and how we are going to begin to communicate things to the public, for instance, the facilities update will not just be, you know, a series of questions kind of fired off and then answered there. It, it'll be issued in the form of a report. There are some folks in that department not, uh, I'll say, not happy about how their work was represented publicly. So we're kind of going to work on the communication side of that. But other than that, it's, I'm, I'm, it, 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 there wasn't, there's not a lot to update about. It was, it was a brief meeting, I'll say. Um, so I had, had a question. Is there opportunity? Because it is, it is, it's only a 20, 25 minute meeting, correct? The right, the right, the public section. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a way um, to rearrange the order of the agenda so that we can like, put the priority topic, if you will, um, up, up front so that that conversation can happen? Because you ran out of time and members had to leave, so um. right, right, and and um, in in addition to doing that, like you know, sort of how we're doing with the facilities report, kind of kind of getting it in, into a more distilled fashion to, to take up less time, so that we can focus a little bit more on on the things that that you know the public kind of wants us to talk about, and you know our staff wants us to talk about. So yeah. The communication side, I guess, is, is what yeah. we need to work on a little better here. So, um, yeah, great. Uh, Mr. Demling, you had a question? Yeah, so is, is uh, I'm just trying to think about, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think about what can be accomplished at this committee and productively, like, is is there disagreement on the committee about what I, what agenda items ought to be taken up with the 
And the 25 minute thing I'm a little confused about too. Uh, they're like, <laughs> like, that's a really small amount of time to handle something as big as the efficacy of the MLA. <laughs> I mean, even if you yeah. wanted to, right? To be able to have like a good discussion on it. So like, um, it's it sounds like maybe like we're not on the same page about it or like, I don't know. I don't want to read into it too much, but. Yeah, uh, so I won't, I won't say that there was necessarily a ton of disagreement, but where there was a, where there was compromise that caused that that time crunch, is that that they wanted to kind of the APA reps on the the JLNSC wanted to kind of parcel out a, a, a portion of time to talk about you know issues you know of confidential nature that that sort of thing, and that's like the pre meeting, which is kind of that 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 got sliced off of the original meeting time and. Personally, I feel like if we're talking about safety, I don't, I don't, my personal opinion, and I don't speak for the grander body here, is that you can't limit time. Time can't be your limit when you're talking about safety and health and these sorts of things. I think they, they need to be more goal-oriented conversations rather than to be encapsulated in this little time period. But that that's my personal opinion. I don't know if, if Mr. Sullivan feels differently or anyone else but that's that's kind of where i'm at right now i do feel differently i i can respond to mr demling because i didn't even get the invitation to the private party that took place from 4 to 420 so i missed out on that and what i feel is going on is that when they get to the public part of the session the apea feels that that's their private time to ask the town health person their questions, and it's not really, and then they ask, and they ask you questions, but it's really the whole 20 minutes or 25 minutes is really they. It appears to me or feels to me like they that's just their time to ask questions, and we're just supposed to sit there and answer them. We I feel like if we ask them a question, that they're not going to even answer it. Ms. Seeger? I am curious about if you can speak to this generically or however, um, what constitute as, constitutes um, a private part of the meeting? Like what what's the content there like in a, I guess, vague way, if you can talk about it? Yeah, so, so I'll talk about what it's supposed to be what those conversations are supposed to be it's supposed to be the time that we talk about you know issues where where you know it might be a building specific issue where somebody's identity might be divulged and, and we wouldn't want to do that publicly but um i i guess and, and dr morris can kind of speak to this that it, it's it's almost like that's the separate section to ask questions to dr morris I, I, that's that's kind of been about how they've played out i don't i don't want to no, I think that's right. I think there are sometimes there are questions where confidentiality would be would be breached and and it's important that there is a space for those conversations to occur uh, outside public view because um, just there are certain topics where we might be talking about an individual situation. Um, and that happens. That's not atypical for any relationship between a bargaining unit and administration. Um, and that's not particular to APEA. I mean, the same thing goes on for all of our bargaining units. Usually they filter through Ms. Cunningham and, and HR. In this case, you know, I'm in, involved in that and that's fine given the context of the situation. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you would agree with that, Ben, but that's sort of my sense of it is it's, it's um, trying to maintain communication that might involve individually identifying situations. Yep, yeah, the, the topic's not fit for public consumption basically. Ms. Seeger? So, sort of separately, is there a way that if, is there a way to create a channel for the APA to ask questions to Emma Dragon that's outside of this? Um, if they're general questions about what's going on, that, that's not really applicable to the JLMSC. So is there a way we can get, I mean, I'm sure anyone can contact her at any time. So I'm just curious about if that could change. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we have a meeting tomorrow and, and it's not a JLMC meeting, but it is a meeting um, that Emma is coming to, you know, on a specific topic. So short story is short answer is yes. Trying to work on brevity. Mr. Demling. 
Yeah, I just want to say briefly, you know, as we're wrapping this up, you know, I appreciate the efforts, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Harrington. Um, you know, I mean, you can only do what you can do. You, you can't make people talk about what they don't want to talk about. And, you know, um, we'll, we'll keep trying as we are on other avenues to, you know, push this, push this conversation ahead. So thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Okay, so um, we will move on to our next item, um, which is the FY22 budget outlook. Um, and I'm going to look to Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter. Yep, also. so uh, we, we thought we'd frame this, you know, to take a step back. Typically, we present budgets in, in January, an overview budget. Um, February, a detailed budget. March is a budget vote. Um, what's particularly challenging this year, of course, is no one knows what the budget's going to look like in FY22 at the state level. Um, the local level could be greatly affected based on how many, you know, in the town of Amherst, how many students are back and what restrictions or lack thereof there are when we get to spring. Um, a whole lot of variables that we, you know, the governor just passed the FY21 budget with some vetoes that are still going on. So there's a lot of moving pieces. But the, the point we wanted to bring tonight was that at the 410 meeting, and this was referenced last week, there was seemed to be what we heard is a request from the town of Amherst to keep level funding and even uh, request perhaps isn't the way it was worded, but I think it was more, it was a little stronger than that, that that's sort of their expectation. Um, so, you know, we did not provide that data at the four town meeting um, based on the kind of all the different assessment methods. It was hard for us to come up with a budget with Amherst zeroed out in terms of a level funded budget. I want to just delineate that level funded budget means the same amount of funding one year to the next, which involves for almost every organization a significant budget reduction because, you know, we well our we have negotiated contracts that are ending. Uh, we have cost of living increases. Um, other things go up. Our retirement goes up. Health insurance typically goes up. Uh, a whole lot of costs go up um, that aren't that are fixed. Um, and so uh, what I asked Dr. Slaughter to present tonight is uh, a, a similar document to the Fort Town meeting, uh, but with Amherst sort of zeroed out in a couple of different scenarios. So you could see what the overall budget cut number was. Uh, we're not going to get detailed into, we're not ready to get detailed into exactly what those cuts would mean, but I have just some numeric comparisons that might be helpful in terms of framing. Uh, they'll also segue nicely into the next topic when we talk about capital. Um, not nicely, that's a awkward. They'll segue into that topic. So take out the adverb or adjective, whichever it is. Uh, but I'll turn over to Dr. Slaughter and he can share his screen and show uh, the extent of the fiscal situation, uh, which we all know is very difficult, but if we uh, show Amherst at a lower number. So um, Doug, do you mind taking it away? It helps if I unmute myself first. Um, I'm hoping that, that uh, what I'm sharing is is available to you all. Uh, yeah, I would recommend Doug just talking through. I don't think you have to talk through all the charter reimbursement lines and interest, but the bottom line of uh, of some of these different methods and what the implications are in terms of budget cut. Um, right. I think that that's probably the piece that for people who are viewing who can't make out the details on your document that uh, I'd love to make more visible or audible as it is. Sure. Um, and I guess the first question is, can everybody see what I'm presenting? I'm not 100% certain with, with uh, I don't do this very often, so I wanna make sure. But just to orient everyone to the to the chart here, this is the same chart we saw before. Um, I believe at your last meeting, Mr. Dimley made the rough envelope uh, estimate that 1.7 million in cuts would, would potentially uh, get Amherst to a level of funded circumstance, and it, and it pretty much is. Uh, so that's what we're showing here. So, so basically the assumptions about, um, you know what we think it's going to take to uh, to have level services. Uh, what we think are our projections for uh, state revenues and aid and and reimbursements. That sort of thing. Those are all exactly as they were presented at the four towns meeting. So none of that's really changed. And so the really the big driver of, of what's changed here is is how much in cuts would be required to get to to roughly a uh, a level a, a level funded budget for Amherst. And so we we're in these uh, in the current you know, scenario of how we fund the budget with 45% statutory uh, five-year rolling uh, statutory method uh, and the rest in the in the uh, traditional or, or regional agreement method, which is the one we're funding this year. Um, you know, if we were to cut that, that large a number, uh, Amherst would be at 0.05% less 
than this year. So it's a very, very tiny difference from this year, um, you know, on the order of like $10,000. Um, and if we go to 55% and, and or uh, further up to, to, to 65%, which were, were numbers that were uh, considered uh, possible for, for a couple of communities, 55% uh, statutory method would, would increase Amherst's uh, uh, assessment by 0.05%. So less than half a percent, less than half of one-tenth percent. So that's a really small uh, change. Uh, I think the real critical conversations around, well, what, what goes into $1.7 million worth of, of change in our, in, our, uh, in our offerings? In other words, what do we have to do to, uh, to get on, you know, one million seven hundred thousand dollars reduced out of our our budget, uh, and that's a pretty significant uh, uh, and deep um, level of cuts that we'd have to experience to to get to that. Um, so I think I'll I'll stop there and and see if there are any other points that that either the superintendent wanted me to address or or if you guys had questions. Yeah, if I could jump in, Chair McDonald. Um, so I think uh, just three points I want to make. So one is that Amherst being zeroed out in terms of Amherst being uh, a 0% increase on all these methods means that the district cuts its budget. It, the budget actually goes down by about 1%. So I think that's a really critical point because people might assume, oh, well, if Amherst stays at zero, the whole budget is level funded. That is not the case because of the associate, the relations between the member towns. It's actually reduced and I can in good conscience uh, recommend to you, you may all want me to or choose to, a budget that actually um, is 1% less than the current year's budget. Um, I mean, I'll be, I'll be unusually blunt in saying that uh, if you look at other districts that have not passed their budgets um, and have to go to the 112th budget, uh, you know, and that process, there's another one that's in there for the second year in a row, uh, typically they don't have less money the year after than they spent the current year. Right. Even in those terrible situations where the state comes in and they're sort of making decisions on assessment method and and dollar amounts. So uh, I want to stress that that's one point I want to stress. The second point I want to stress is, um, well, we wouldn't we'd make cuts that weren't just professional staff um, just to put a number on it. It's roughly 26 teachers. Would be one point seven million dollars. This is going to be a wildly different educational experience. You know, over the past couple of years, we cut uh, $1.1 million a few years ago. We cut over half, around half a million dollars last year. Um, there's a lot of variables on this budget, health insurance, you know, negotiated contracts, right? This, so it's not a hard 1.7, but that's the scale of magnitude we're talking about, right? This is a huge, huge dollar amount. We've already made the cuts that we felt like we were able to make. We've cut a lot of soft costs. We have not cut a lot of teachers over the last couple of years, given the budget situation we have. And we're sort of at the end of the road uh, of being able to, to look at things that are farther away from the classroom. And so we obviously will continue to look. Doug, myself, Doreen, meeting later this week, we're meeting with principals and all the things that you would imagine us to be doing. But we've been through this before. It's not like, oh, this is, we're looking at the budget for the first time. We've made those cuts year in, year after year. And at this point, the reason we use Choice Revolving, you know, at a high level last year is as a one-year stopgap carryover because we didn't have anywhere else to go that was far away from the classroom. Um, my third point I'll save for the next budget item, actually. Um, I'll make some uncharacteristically blunt comments about capital as well, but I, I think I'll save that since it's its own agenda item. But I just wanted to stress the magnitude of what we're talking about here. I guarantee the number will change, whatever it is, 1.7, 1.4, you know, because we have variables that a month from now, hopefully, knock on wood, we'll know the answer to that we don't know now. Um, but it's not going to swing nine digits. It's not going to be like, oh, all of a sudden we have like $40 to cut. That's not in the cards from what we're, you know, we have. And so, you know, we are going to have to look for guidance and, you know, and I think uh, from you all about how to approach this, but I can't knowingly say that we're going to cut 1% of our budget, um, you know, going into next year, because uh, I don't think it's educationally sound. So sorry for, for, for those comments, but I just wanted to, you know, try to put my finer point on it. Karen, uh, Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, I also noticed that Mr. Demling had his hand raised virtually, so 
Um, but I have a feeling we're going to be saying some similar things, which is this is um, this is really it's just upsetting. And in a year that there are estimates out there that you know COVID and and COVID's not going away. We're going to continue to have um, costs related to cleaning. I don't think anybody's going to go back to like reducing the amount of cleaning that's going to happen in the schools. If anything, you know, taking keeping level services funding and then taking, you know, just for Amherst, it, it, it's actually going to be larger because the cost of educating our kids while COVID is still around is going to increase the overall costs um, for the district. And so yeah. I, I think this is what we need to start the conversation with convincing, you know, there was this question that Margaret brought up of like, who, who should we be, um, who should, and I'm on the budget committee, so, um, I'm somewhat talking to myself now, but I'd love your feedback, you know, the committee's feedback on whether that seems right. But I, I think we do, because the Amherst Town Council is where we're getting this directive from, I think this story needs to be told loudly and clearly to them and to the members of the, the, the four um, towns meeting, you know, when, when that happens again. But I do think at the same time is we're gonna need the public to be, um, calling on their elected officials, you know, in, in town council to to make the case for why these cuts are really, really damaging. I mean, the big thing I'm worried about is, you know, I I don't think it's a secret. I, you know, I went, went to Amherst high schools and I think we have been seeing <laughs> just to put up, you know, I don't know specifically which programs we're going to have to cut, but I think one of the strongest things about our school district is the variety. And we have seen that we've been losing that variety of offerings for our kids. You know, I got to, you know, choose from like four or five languages when I was a student here. There are arts programs, there are music programs. And I would just be heartbroken if we need to continue to reduce the offerings to our, our district. So I think to the extent that we can in the budget committee meeting and working with administration to, I know it feels early to put programs on the line and I don't want to scare anybody, you know, like it's a real balancing act. But I think we need to say bluntly, like we probably won't be able to have the breadth of services that make our schools as excellent as they are. And to the extent that we can push back on the directive we're getting from the town council, I think we need to, and we need to get the, the community members on our side. And I know that, you know, there are other um, agencies and, and, you know, causes in the district that, that we, not the district, but the, t you know, the towns that we're asking for this funding from, and, and I'm not saying anybody's having an easy year. I just, I really think this is, is needs to be prioritized. And so I appreciate you putting these numbers together. And I think we need to do everything we can to, to start telling the story. So I'm looking forward to Thursday. Mr. Demling. Uh, plus one to everything Ms. Spitzer said. Um, I, so I have a number of questions and comments, Dr. Morris, so get your, get your pencil out. Um, yeah, so school committee and superintendent raised the alarm on next year's budget crisis or on the budget crisis for next year. I, like that needs to be the headline. Like if Mr. Burzbach, if you're out there, like, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, I, I was, you know, thinking about this coming into this and, you know, before when you were talking in the last week or two about the $1 million cut or the potential $1.4 million cut, you, you cat cat characterize that as pretty catastrophic and a radically different school system with a huge impact on class sizes. So I'm wondering how you would classify the funding level that the town of Amherst is proposing to us. The town manager and the town finance director has given to the town council and that the, the, the town council's finance committee is now considering and that we got zero pushback on at the four towns meeting from representatives from the town of Amherst. I mean, I hate to call it out like that, but like, like we have to sound the alarm. <laughs> like, um, and it's very uncomfortable for me as a public official on the school committee to do this because um, Amherst has such a, an excellent history, even in, even in difficult financial times, uh, and we've been through a lot, of, of, of excellent relationship with, with town government. And um, this is going back to you know, town meeting days. Um, and I say this both at the elementary and at the regional budget level. And not that there haven't been friction points occasionally, but you know, you look across the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and and for many districts, it is it is crisis every single year, even in non-COVID, even in non-financial uh, strain times. You know, it's always you know schools fighting against other departments. 
So, you know, to have enjoyed the level of support we have is, is a major factor in, in why we have the level of services we do. And so I think it's less about how do we, you know, engage confrontationally or how do we fight as, as it is about educate, you know, so, so I, I, I'm glad to see some meat being put on the bone of that of that cut. So $1.7 million, superintendent says, is 26 cut teachers next year. So the town of Amherst is proposing a funding level uh, that would mean the loss of 26 staff at, at the region. We haven't talked about the other districts yet. I think we need to get more meat on that bone. I think we need more details. We, the more details, the better. And I understand that it that it's really difficult and the numbers change. Um, but the, 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 the process schedule challenge we have here, right, is that the, the budget setting uh, train for the town of Amherst has already left the station, right? They had, they had, the, indi they had the financial indi indicators meeting, the finance committee is, is in the process. I think this month is, if I recall from their, from their chair saying this at the Four Towns meeting, they're, they're going to make their recommendation to the town council. The town council won't do their final budget approval for, you know, month yet, but, um, and I see Dr. Morris's hand me, so maybe I have that incorrect. Um, yeah, but, but, but the fact that, you know, point being we have a lot of work to do to um, to tell that story, and and I think I think that's what's what's at the end of the day that's our responsibility. You know, I think we don't have the power to make that final budget approval call. We do have the power of the regional school committee to make the assessments, and there's a process of how that rolls out. But I think I think what we have our responsibility as school committee members is to educate. Um, the town council, but what are the actual impacts of those decisions, right? The full consequences, like we, we need to make sure that not just the town of Amherst, but all our member towns are making these, these decisions with eyes wide open to the full impact. And then if, you know, decisions are made, they're made, but at least we've done our job about, about, about the impact. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll just pause there because it's probably, your pencil is probably running out. Um. I know that Dr. Slaughter's had his hand up for a while. Um, so um, since Ms. Spitzer and then Dr. Morris, and then I see your hand also, Ms. Stancer. So I'll, I'll let Mr. Uh, Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris duke it out about who speaks right now. <laughs> Dr. Slaughter's hand was way, way before mine, so uh, <laughs> defer to him. So I'll, uh, I'll just uh, touch on a couple of quick things um, that, that I wanted to, to bring to to, uh, to bear in, in this conversation. Number one is that, uh, to, to something Ms. Spitzer said, is that, um, you know, I, I think our paradigm has changed a little bit. So there's some things, even if COVID were completely gone, uh, there are, we're, we're different than we were having headed into this. And so the nature of, you know, well, should I wear gloves while doing this? Should I put on a mask? You know, there are gonna be needs along those lines. Should I have a, uh, you know, should I keep the air filter running in my room? Uh, people are gonna want to and, and uh, and need to, you know, have those kinds of things in there, which inherently sort of builds a little extra into our budget that, that wasn't there before. Um, and so I think that's a, you know, just a, a paradigm shift in, in some of our operations that are a little bit different um, that I don't think are going to go away in the, in the short term. Um, the other thing I would point out to just the community at large is that, you know, in, you know people will bring up the nature of uh, declining enrollment and the, the difficulty is uh, with enrollment decline, you typically have to take a more staggered uh, reduction as you go through that. In other words, a reduction of 10 students doesn't immediately uh, trigger the need to have one less class of something. So it, it tends to be a very disjointed, in some respects, uh, uh, shrinking when you have fewer students. So even though we will, uh, we currently have fewer students, we may get several of them back next year if, if we're uh, able to and the circumstances are different, uh, but we may not. But either way, you're going to make those transitions from from a you know from a purely enrollment standpoint over a period of time that tend to come in 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 uh, more stair step ma manner. Um, and the third thing I'd, I I would say is uh, relative to the relationship with with that has traditionally gone on between the the school committee and the and the town government in Amherst has been very very good, and I think it will continue to be good. I have every confidence that it will be. Um, I think the thing we have uh, as part of our, the task for the subcommittee and, and for the superintendent, myself and others, uh, is an education one. Because I think that if you look at the composition of the council, and this is not a majority statement at all, they're fairly new to it. And, and the budgets that they've been through have not been difficult ones. And so it's not, um, 
a circumstance where they've had to uh, take a deep dive into some of these difficult uh, conversations around what is what is this choice versus this choice mean? You know, compare and contrast those things. So I think that um, you know we, we've got to kind of bring them up the learning curve uh, to prepare them for those difficult conversations and to think deeply about um, you know the context of those changes for our schools as well as the other departments within the town as they go through their process. Um, so they have a they have a steep learning curve that they many of them haven't had to deal with because we haven't had a budget year quite like this one in in, in a few years and and a, most I, I'd say majority of the of the members have not gone through that in the in the way they will have to this year. Dr. Morris. Yep, and I'll uh, I'll try to a lot of delicate topics tonight. I'll try to do my best. Um, but uh, here's what I'd say is this: uh, the region is not a part of town of Amherst. It's not a part of its municipal government. It's a separate entity that is funded by the four towns. It sets its own budget, it needs to be funded by the four towns. And so um, I guess I would just encourage the committee to, to think about the autonomy that you have. Um, there's pluses and minuses to that autonomy. You know, that's, that's a, it'd be a great topic for another day. Um, but I think in terms of how you approach this, I understand the town council setting its guidance. Um, you are responsible for coming up with a budget that you think is a responsible budget, both fiscally and educationally, and having the towns either voted up or voted down. And so I would just encourage the committee to not, my opinion, to not feel as rushed um, to do its due diligence and make its decisions. Um, I feel a little differently in the two districts that I work for that are part of municipal government, um, because the reality is if the budget gets voted down, there's a process by which, you know, that the state comes in and, or it gets revoted. And those scenarios have to be compared to the scenario that Doug put up earlier. And so, um, I'm not saying that I disagree with Mr. Demling. First of all, I just want to be really clear. I didn't say 26 teachers are going to be cut. I'm just saying if you do the math on 26 teachers and the cost, that's what it adds up to be. We would certainly look at all sorts of costs. So just I think if, if Scott's watching, I just want to be really clear about that. Um, I'm not suggesting 26 teachers uh, are going to be cut. But that is I, the reason why I think it's a good number is it actually shows the gravity, right? And that's why I, I, it, was just, it was an easy number. It's not actually what we'd come up with, right? We'd come up with... Uh, a number of other things, but th there would be significant cuts to class, you know, significant impacts on class size. There'd be significant cuts to elective programs. There'd be con significant cuts to extracurricular. You can't cut $1.7 million and, and not hit all three of those areas. Uh, just not possible. So so I think, I think it's important to state that explicitly like I'm trying to now, but I also think that you have a lot of autonomy at the regional level uh, that obviously has to go back to town and I wanna maintain that good relationship with all four of our member towns, not just the town of Amherst, uh, at the same time, we are funded by the towns. We are not part of their their municipal governments. And so I do think there's some opportunity perhaps to um, for the committee to set its course um, on its timeline uh, to obviously be communicating frequently with member towns. Um, but it is a really different entity than the Amherst Public Schools or the Pelham Public Schools or Shrewsbury Lever Public Schools are for that matter in terms of being a part of town government. We are autonomous. Uh, I, I think there's more minuses than pluses, frankly, on that. But one plus is that in these situations, um, I, I don't want the committee to feel like they don't have power to set their timeline, set their budget, and the towns can do what the towns want to do. But um, there is high risk to everybody about not having a passed budget. Um, but, but I believe that you all can steer the ship um, pretty significantly on that front. So other people may disagree with that perspective, but I just wanted to share that's where I come from. Ms. Ms. Stancer, you had your hand up a while ago. Yeah, I guess listening to Mr. Damlane and Dr. Slaughter, um, and I'm thinking, I think, thinking about the subcommittee and, and what we will try to do, it sure seems like we have some work to do to delve into the past years so that people can understand why we are now saying this is a really drastic time because we need to be able to show that we've cut budgets in the past and what, what we've done, you know, what have we cut in the past? 
so that we can now say headline, this is, we got a real problem, you know? So I, I, if you disagree, let me know, but that's, I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. I think um, the, I, I see your hand, Mr. Demling, out, out, um, but one, um, one other comment it, it, that was really helpful framing, Dr. Moss, I think, for, for us to be thinking through this, because that sort of pivoted. I, I knew that, but the way you framed it was really helpful. It's sort of new thinking. Um, but one of the thoughts, too, that we've heard people talking about how um, at least one member communities had come in giving specific guidance that had a slight increase in, into um, what they were willing to fund. Um, in contrast to Amherst coming in and saying level funding and that impact. So it's helpful to see what that looks like, Dr. Slaughter. Um, but what's interesting too is by seeing it that way, you can see that the magnitude of impact that one that Amherst has on the overall thing. So that even if that member community did say, well, you know, we we are willing to actually pay more, the member community, the other towns can't make up the difference that Amherst is not saying is not willing to to fund. So, um, you know, order of magnitude, it's it's several hundred thousand dollars um, that that sort of it's is well more than that but um you know there there's only so much you know a, a two percent difference or one percent difference from one of the non amherst towns is not going to make up for that half a percent or whatever from from amherst so i think that's a really important distinction to make too because it we we've, we've heard um people saying well maybe every town should just pay what they're what they're willing to pay but that's not that's not going to solve anything um and in fact could make it even worse. Um, so I, I appreciate that framing um, as we go into this. And I saw somebody else, oh, Mr. Demling, your hand. And did... Yeah, so I, I appreciate a lot of the comments here. Um, the, the, the point about us being an autonomous legal entity and setting our own timeline. So I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, um, you know, there, there was another, you know, uh, some some frank input that we received um, from the town council about, well, you know, you're the school committee, you ought to be driving this this process and setting setting this course where the member towns and um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, uh, in, ter in terms of framing it. So in terms of, um, you know, the budget subcommittee and, and how do we organize these communications? What, what role can we play? I think maybe thinking about how um our school our committee's outreach and engagement with each of our member towns uh can go timeline wise uh across this budget cycle and then as, as early as possible at least just setting that expectation of okay here's here's the schedule and so you know we we know we know when we have to pass a budget right and so you put that in the, in the calendar we know where we are now now what are what are the points between that we know we're going to um have some additional four towns meetings where we'll have other updated finances from the state and whatnot, and be able to give give a more up. And so, if if we're able to say, you know, who's driving the bus on the um, on the regional budget, it, if there's if there's a, a clear clear communication that the school committee is driving the bus, I think that would help. Plus, you know, not not to forget last meeting, you know, we passed a, I mean, I would call it a, a value statement, but um, you know, we passed a motion saying that. We're committed to working with our member towns to not level fund and to cut less than a million dollars. Um, so, you know, Dr. Morris, I heard you say earlier, you know, if 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 we feel like 1.7 million, you know, we've already, you know, <laughs> voted we're not cutting 1.7 million. And we could always go back on that vote, I suppose. Um, but the, the point being is that I, I think I think early on, you know, we've established that, you know, at, at the very least, we want to keep these cuts as small as they can and we're committed to working with our member towns and then sort of demonstrating that with the with the schedule um i, th I think would be good and th the point about the past years is is critical um you know uh, showing what happened to uh, was it two or three years ago at the health insurance trust and and, and what happened last year and 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 i think too I'll, I'll keep hammering this every time this discussion comes up but the the more detail we get you know um we've talked about what does that mean in terms of teachers but, but even even if we're not committing to it, you know, giving some examples, what does 1.7 or 1.4 or $1 million cut, what does that look like 
at the region? How does that feel? You know, who, who experiences that pain? And then giving some very specific examples, I think in terms of education and, and understanding that, that impact, I think that, that goes a long way. I'm going to um, suggest we, we transition, transition a little bit to talking about sort of what, um, what our budget subcommittee can be working on um, and, and that timing, because I think sort of all of that, setting, setting what our schedule will be, I think could be um, a, a helpful, so building on what you were just talk, d describing, uh, Mr. Dunley, um, in terms of driving the bus, right? Um, so I, I, it would be helpful, I think, for if when the budget subcommittee meets uh, to sort of partner with um, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter and sort of mapping out what could be that schedule and when when do we want to go back to call um, additional four towns meetings with what information and what what sort of overall timeline to get us to us approving a budget. And it sounds like to answer the other, your other question about who our audience is, it's very much our member towns as well as the public, but I think starting with the decision makers in the towns. Um, Ms. Kenny. I think um, we've kind of been talking about heading in this direction anyway, but I think as specific as we can get with what these cuts will look like, like 26 teachers, we won't have a Spanish department. There won't be gym class. Like, even if those aren't where we would make those budget cuts, but to put actual, like, you know, details into that and what that would mean, not only for our schools as, as a whole, right, um, but also for our individual students and how, and how that will change for them. I mean, I think, um, you know, like Ms. Spitzer, I went to Amherst High too, and there were lots of choices then. And for my kids to then come through and for them to have a radically different experience than I did, you know, that's one of the biggest draws for our, for all, all four of our communities, right? Is like our schools are, are fantastic. Um, and, and so showing what those cuts will look like on a very specific, you know, like minute detail, e like not to hold anybody to like, we will not have Spanish, we're cutting the whole Spanish department, but like what that would look like, I think will be really helpful in getting our point across and help raise the alarm that says, you know, lots of people move to the community because of the schools and we will not be able to provide that, which will then, you know, cycle us down a road I don't think anybody wants to go down. I, I think um, I am just sort of circling, connecting back to our first topic tonight on the ELL and talking about sort of what's, what is the work that's needed there and, um, and, and that program. I mean, there's, there's certain, certain sort of services and supports and things that we, we have in our schools that we, we can't take away. So that, that leaves sort of other, other programs um, much more sort of in, in, the, in, the, in the target zone, if you will, for, for those cuts. And I think maybe without specifying, like it's this, it's sort of like describing what are the, what are the less safe zones for, um, you know, target areas for that we'd have to, where we'd have to go looking for, for those 26 teachers or potentially. I want to clarify, I absolutely do not think we should cancel the Spanish program or anything like that. I just mean as, <laughs> as an example of something that would be really, really terrible to lose. But, you know, just wanted to be clear about that. <laughs> okay. Um, any other, um, are, are we, I, I believe we, we're only, it's Ms. Stancer and Ms. Spitzer on the, on the budget subcommittee, but if there's anybody else that would um, like to join them, I'm, I'm sure that they would welcome additional hand signs in that effort. <laughs> yeah. um, we do have Heather also, but yes, any, anybody else, you know, and feedback, any comments, if you think of anything after the meeting, um, please send it along in a, I guess, in a note would be the way to do that. 
I apologize, um, Ms. Lord. I, I do remember that you volunteered last week. I, I apologize for missing that. <laughs> um, great. Do you do you subcommittee members feel like you have what you need to to answer to answer your questions coming into tonight? Okay. Excellent. I think so. Anything more before we move on? Um, and so staying a little bit on, on budget, but now moving to capital um, spending, um, we wanted to talk about these topics that came up. We were asked questions during the Four Towns meeting about um, the capital or CP, use of CPA funds for the athletic fields and solar canopies. So um, I'll look to you, yeah. Doug. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass it to Doug in a second. I think, you know, as a general comment, you know, I'm highly supportive, and I want to be on the record for highly supportive of, of you know, anything we do to make our schools greener. I think it's consistent with our ethos. I think it's it's preaching what we practice in terms of having a ninth grade that teaches environmental science as a core requirement, which I'm supportive of, and uh, and, and all the things that about our community and the net zero bylaw in Amherst, and I think the general sense of conservation that goes on in all four of our member towns. Um, I do have to note that, you know, and, and Doug will speak to this in the CPA funds, and maybe those funds are already appropriate in other ways, but I have a hard time thinking about spending of capital items being at the same level, which I know is the goal of some of our towns, um, while we're making significant operational cuts. You know, um, I, I just have a hard time with it, right? If there's not cars under the solar canopies because we don't have enough staff to use the parking lot that we would be repaving, maybe we should just all park it over at the middle school and we don't need the district office parking lot anymore, even though it's got potholes and all that, right? And just to, to, you know, I'm a big supporter of the project, but I, I do want to say the juxtaposition of the cost of projects while we're, you know, potentially looking at cutting significant numbers of staff feels very uncomfortable to me uh, if it's not about health and safety, right, directly about health and safety. One could certainly make the argument that solar canopies in terms of greenhouse gases is, but um, that's not the environment that we're in right now in terms of fiscal. Um, and the same with the athletic fields, you know, I can't can't promise that if we're cutting 1.7 million dollars that athletics won't be affected athletics were affected the last time we had a big cut reduced number of games and so you know i get that these are popular projects i get that i'm supportive of them you know i definitely heard from families spent a lot of time a couple of years ago for those of you who are on the committee you have spent a lot of time on this a couple of years ago about the condition of the fields um it's really important that that improves at the same time uh you know the, the juxtaposition is just hard for me so I just want to share that publicly. I want counselors and select board members and finance committers advocating for capital projects for the regional schools. In general, regional schools get short shrift, not ours, but in general on capital projects because you know when you're part of municipal government, it, it folds really nicely into capital projects. When you're part of a region and you're its own entity and you're not part of a municipal, this is what I was referencing earlier, sometimes it, it works actually disadvantageous. Uh, and I think that we see that difference in the Amherst public schools and the regional schools and how that works out for capital, uh, especially as it relates to technology and other matters. Uh, at the same time, you know, I don't want to dismiss the importance of both of these projects. I want to be on the record. I'm highly supportive of them. But I think when push comes to shove and, and we're seeing uh, if we do go forward and see significant capital funds go towards them uh, as we're reducing staffing um, to levels that none of us here are comfortable with, I think it's just going to be a hard moment for all of us, you know, or I'll say it would be a hard moment for me um, to do that, not because I don't support the solar, you know, part of a parking lot and not because I don't support the fields. I absolutely do. They're both projects that need to happen. Um, but I also think we need to make sure we have the staff needed to support our students in school. And so, you know, I think that's going to be a very difficult calculus as we move forward. So I just wanted to share a wildly long qualification uh, and introduction to Dr. Slaughter, who I think is going to be much more factual and concise than, um, than my comments. But I was, uh, I did have a reaction at the fourth internal reaction, you know, hearing that dialogue um, uh, as, and we always have this capital and operational. If you never spend on capital, if you always put all your money in operational, you know, you end up in bad situations. I'm on board with spending on capital. Don't get me wrong. Um, but when, when our, when our potential budget cut number, uh, you know, is as high as $1.7 million, um, that's a hard, that's a hard pill for me to swallow. Um, so, uh, I'll leave that with Dr. Slaughter. He can explain some of the CPA pieces and other pieces moving forward, because I think both projects are, are, are certainly overdue and very, very important 
but I can't pretend that we're not in the context we're in. Right, and so I, I think, um, you know, relative to the solar, I think the, the original, you know, if, if we look back, the, the capital project that we were going to, I believe, partner with the town of Amherst a little bit on was, a, was more a solar study. Canopies was one component that was going to be looked at relative to that. I think that uh, no one has less interest in doing, uh, you know, that we, we don't have less interest than we did have. We have the same level of interest and need that we had before. Uh, the economics have changed around us. And so that's, that's uh, you know, the unfortunate place we find ourselves. Uh, and so I think our, our, our impacts on, on things environmental will, will need to probably be much more focused on uh, smaller and more uh, internal uh, types of adjustments that we're trying to make. Um, and I, I referenced one at the at the Port Towns meeting. You know, one of the things that have has happened through uh, through uh, some funding from the electric company is to to uh, relamp uh, a number of bulbs within you know the buildings, and that's saving us uh, you know energy and 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 ultimately money, but but also saving the amount of greenhouse gases we produce because we're just using less electricity than we were. Um, so I think we're going to continue to explore those things that that are uh, available and become available to us and, and continue to refine and, and uh, perfect as we can the things we can do uh, as quickly as we can. Um, shifting to the sort of CPA circumstance. Um, so, you know, in in the uh, sort of uh, planning last spring before COVID hit, uh, we had a small chunk of, of uh, state aid that had come in for uh, use uh, in in the region that we were thinking, oh, we'll take a portion of that and do some preliminary work to get started on some design work for the for the fields to uh, sort of um, uh, clarify and, and articulate uh, you know some pros and cons of of reorienting the fields and and talk about the pros and cons to some extent of of the surfaces that we could explore there and and sort of kickstart the program a little bit and then. The idea was to take some CPA money and, and start to move the design forward. Um, and of course, with, with the change in circumstances uh, that we had last spring, you know, we leveraged that money for other purposes. Um, and so we didn't do that preliminary work. Um, and so at this point, you know, the CPA money that we have received from the town is certainly uh, likely to be utilized for that purpose and for, you know, uh, continuing into the design phase, uh, beginning design phases for those fields and, and track. Um, but I think, you know, and I've said this before on some of these, there are things you can do with those so, sorts of designs that, that are uh, always useful and available and, and uh, good information. But then there are other aspects of it uh, that have a certain shelf life. Um, so we want to be cognizant of that as we move forward relative to, to, uh, to trying to move ahead with, with that larger capital project is, is can we... And should we leverage CPA money? Can we use that uh, and strike the right balance with the other communities to help in support uh, through their CPA funds to help support that project? But uh, again, I think it, at at this moment in time, given the, the circumstances with the you know in, in the uh, the upcoming budget, um, you know I think the town as well as as the the uh, the town of Amherst, I should say, as well as the other communities, you know would would be uh, a better reflection of our values to to spend more on our uh, operating to keep and preserve our our school district uh, more as we see it and how we think we should you know and what we should offer and and uh, be a little patient relative to our capital needs on on this front. Um, uh, you know, the the fields you know have some health and safety concerns. I won't diminish that at all, and and we do want to address those as quickly and as best we can. Uh, but relative to some some of the other more uh, broadly impactful and and significant things we've talked about earlier this evening about our operating budget, I think it's it's tough to move forward on on capital projects of that size uh, that that don't have uh, the highest level of urgency and and these have a high level of urgency but not the highest level of urgency is how I would say it. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments from the committee? Ms. Stancer? Um, so I, I don't know if this, if this question is relevant, but I know that in the Pelham Town meeting last spring, we did vote to provide some CPA money for, for the field study. So what would you then say to the town 
about that money if if we decide i mean are you saying we wouldn't use it for that so would we give it back to the town or <laughs> so what i would suggest is it doesn't expire um and so it really would you know it'd be at the town's discretion as to what they would choose so if they wanted to repurpose it for another for another project that they feel has uh more likely to moving forward or that has more urgency uh you know that's certainly their prerogative and i i would by any means, I, I, I think in the short term, if, if, you know, with that money that has been appropriated for our use, um, we're going to hold on to that. And, and you know, if, if they decide that it's still okay to fund that kind of a project, we'll wait and see if we can fit it into a capital plan that, that you know, meets with uh, our ability to actually fund the project fully and to do it in a way that's not, uh, you know, in, in lieu of our academic program that we, we need. So I think, you know, it's, it, you know, we're happy to hold on to it. We'll be smart with it. We want to be smart with it. Um, but at the same time, it is the prerogative of the community. So if they decided they needed it back for repurposing for another need that they have, that's certainly within their realm and, and okay. understandable. Um, Dr. Morris? Yeah, I think it may also be worth when we're talking about this decision to bring it to the next Fort Town meeting. Um, for those of you who went to the ones last year, there was some skepticism from some of the member towns, not so much about the study, but actually being able to afford the actual project from capital funds. Um, and, uh, you know, I do think it's worth, separate from what I said earlier about the broader context, just making sure that um, I don't want to do a study that's going to sit on a shelf, right? You know, that happens a lot in organizations. And there was some really broad disagreement last year from some of our member towns about the viability of an actual project, not of the study. So I, I do think before going forward, people's, the town's financial situation certainly has changed. At least some of the towns have indicated that. And, and, and I'd be curious about making sure all the towns are on board before we move forward with the study, because I don't want to set up a, a dynamic that we know is going to be contentious in the back and not go anywhere and, and spend a lot of town's money for no reason. I think the towns need to be done. I want to be really clear. Like, the fields are, are really, they, they need to be a much higher quality. Uh, but what I don't want to do is spend spend sunk cost funds when we know in the tail end, we're not going to have the support of all of our member towns. Ms. Spitzer. You're muted. I, I just wanted to say that I, I I similarly feel like awkward about this idea of funding capital projects while we're cutting our operating budget. And, and we just saw in the past budget cycle where we kind of halted a lot of the spending we were planning on capital in order to, to fill the gap. But I, I think what the interesting thing about the CPA funds is that it's not as though we could use those funds directly to fund anything on the operational side. And if anything, we've seen with our, um, with this current environment, the importance of outdoor spaces. And, and I think the outdoor spaces around our high school and middle school are, I mean, probably all of our schools, but I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the report I saw from, you know, I, I've heard the reports um, about our fields. And it's, if anything, I think some of them are getting more use, at least in the spring, you know, than by community members who weren't necessarily school members. And so I, I could see a case for, if our towns believe that invest specifically the town I, I'm from Amherst, you know, because the, the fields are in our town, that those spaces have benefited our community during this time when getting outside is one of the only safe ways to get together. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is, and this may not be feasible at all, um, but if we could use some of that money to improve the public outdoor spaces in a way that could be responsive to everything that's changed since COVID, because it, it just feels like to, I understand why we don't want to, but it feels like for the entire community, it's not just our schools that use those fields, but the having outdoor space in a, the people can get together safely is really important. And I'd hate to miss an opportunity to improve them. Dr. Morris? And I think, I think you hit on a couple of things that are important. And I, I know we have to move the conversation along. I know it's late, but, but I think that's a point of, um, that I've heard over the years of contention between the four member towns, that one of our member towns, because it happens to be located in the town of Amherst, um, 
there's a lot more community use of the facilities by community members in the town the schools are located in. And that for some of our member communities, and I'm not justifying, I'm not taking sides on this one, but I, I want to be really plain and, and honest about what I've heard, that the, the, the benefit is purely to the, the students who attend Amherst Regional Middle School or Amherst Regional High School, and much less so for the larger community. I'm not saying no one from the library ever comes that never comes down and uses the track, but I would guarantee that it's used more by residents of the town of Amherst than residents of the towns of Shutesbury, Leverett, and Pelham. So I think that's where it gets a little bit difficult to have that conversation. Uh, and everyone has a valid point, right? You know, like there, there's, I don't think anyone comes to that conversation not wanting to support kids or not wanting to support the schools. But I do think the fact that the school happens to be located in one of the towns has an impact on some of the community support. And that's why I think bring it to the four town meeting uh, might be might be warranted and might be helpful in terms of figuring out a path forward to do the things that carries that Miss Spitzer's talking about because I fully endorse everything she just said. Any other, uh, Mr. Demling? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, given my concerns about the current operational, I, so I asked this item to be added to the agenda not because I want to add to our capital request for next year. I. I, I, I no, seriously, and and I value the the the, the fields and the and the solar panels. <laughs> it, these feel like such throwaway comments, right? Yeah, yeah, I value them, but like I do. It's just that you know the reason for bringing this agenda item up for me was because I feel like whatever the questions that we get from our member towns, even if we don't feel like it's something we can do this year, we just need to be in a position to provide the answers, right? So if if we're if we're asking a town to fund us above a level that they're initially telling us that they want to, and then they ask us about X, Y, Z, even if it's not directly correlated, we just we need to be able to provide every answer about X, Y, Z. So if we hear town councilors saying, you know, we want info about the solar efforts and the C, well, here's, here's, here it is, you know, <laughs> like as you've just laid out and, and Doug, Doug, Mr. Slaughter makes the, um, the excellent point about shelf life is, is that, yeah, we could grade, the, the goal is not to have a field study. The goal is to have a field, right? And so, if, if if one does not follow the other, again, eyes wide open, right? Don't 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 fund a study unless you're prepared to to go to go forward with it. So, I, th I think that that's the kind of information that you know we can have organized, available to answer those questions. And I, I think part of, and that helps. I think just build trust, right? Is that like you're you're telling us you have a desire, interest or a concern about? some aspect of operational capital, well, here's here's the information. Okay, now let's go forward and have the more difficult conversations about funding level and whatnot. So I, I appreciate the information you put together. It's exactly what I was looking for. And you know, th thank you for doing it. Um, so are we ready to move on? Um, okay, so moving on, we have a future agenda planning. Um, I think, uh, we have we we have a sort of on our draft com comments um a, a meeting on the 5th of january um but what i'd also like to propose um is that we um i if if feasible i don't know um how the committee is open whether the committee is open to meeting between now and the and january 5th um in executive session we had several several topics that we didn't get to um, in our last one that I think um, it would be helpful for us to continue that. Um, and um, wondering if folks would be open to to doing that um, early in the next week um, versus waiting until the first week of January. I'm seeing nodding heads. Great. Uh, Tuesday, same, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, and then uh, for January, Miss oh, McDonald. Don't. I mean, I don't know if people have a more flexible schedule, but I'll just say for myself, I am not opposed to daytime meetings uh, in the next two weeks. Um, that may not work based on people's work schedules, but um, particularly if it's an executive session where there's not actually other things in the agenda, you know, in terms of viewership or needing to do it at night, I feel like that's reduced. So just wanted to put as a, an idea out there that I don't think daytown meetings, if pure, especially if it's just a executive session, it would be undoable. It may be undoable from people's lives, but I think from a public assets perspective, I, I don't see a conflict. Uh, Ms. Spitzer? 
Well, uh, speaking as somebody who's a parent of three small kids who aren't going to have um, <laughs> school, um, and not just our public schools, but any um, child care, um, it would be difficult unless, and, and especially given the executive session nature, nature of it, because I don't yeah. think it would be legally allowed to have a, I don't know, three-year-old in the background that me, me is there an age limit on that because if so I, <laughs> I can't think of, um i don't know if other people have a similar constraint but that's that's mine um the only reason i'd fight moving it much earlier as much as i'd like to not be on one of these calls late at night yeah no that's fine i just wanted to put it out there um uh, it certainly wasn't a request from me just wanted to put it out as an option um maybe I, we could make me it's six we could start at six instead of six thirty if folks are flexible or or is 6 30 the ideal time i know that some folks have hard hard time moving getting to meetings earlier okay um and then i think on january 5th we have um, a variety of topics already lined up um i'm gonna try and pull that up i have it here allison if you'd you like uh, yeah so we'll have a lot of minutes to approve as mentioned earlier um, we may have an AFSME MOA to take a look at, um, you know, perhaps an update on JLMC and the, and the MOA. Uh, we'll see how that, that conversation goes. Um, I, I want to come back to the attendance piece that Ms. Stancer and others have raised and, and try to respond to that. Um, I think the spring 2021 plan, I mean, the, the, the next school year planning, probably better to, to do at the second meeting in January than the first meeting. Uh, just so I can get a more comprehensive read on the topics people would like to, to talk about. Uh, the time on learning and the live, and not time on learning, excuse me, the live instruction piece from DESI, uh, and I've got snow days. So that's an awful lot of things. Um, there's another meeting later in the month where we'll get deep into budget uh, as well as the 2021-22 school year. Um, we also, I would like to bring up um, something that came from our partner agency, uh, MABE, around the access test uh, and some implications of standardized testing on ELL students. Um, they have a, I don't know if it's quite a petition, but a statement that I'd like to bring to this committee for, for feedback and, and potential endorsement of. It's a packed schedule. <laughs> it is. I'll try to be briefer than tonight. My apologies about this evening. Yeah. Um, Hopefully the update will be much quicker since there will be vacation the next two weeks, right? So that'll help. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, and just a reminder for um, folks at the, that we, to circle back if there's anything more on sort of school year 21, 22 that folks wanted to include in that consideration to email Dr. Morris. Uh, moving on, um, warrant report. Ms. Spitzer, do you have any warrants from the region to report? Um, it doesn't appear that I do. So I think I reported them all last week. Okay. Um, and we don't have gifts this evening. Um, so we are, we caught up a lot of time. We're only 25 minutes past. Um, <laughs> um, uh, would somebody like to make a motion? I move to adjourn the meeting of the regional school committee. I will second that. Move by Stancer, second by McDonald. Um, there's no discussion, so we'll move to a vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Um, Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>